morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for taking your time to participate in today's event. Uh, so, as, as you're aware, the event, uh, the event is entitled Commercial Data Transfers Between UK and EU and the Adequacy Decision. My name is uh, Dr. Edina Herbinha, and I'm a senior lecturer in law at Aston University. And I'm a part of the cross-border data transfers network uh, project that I will shortly tell a little bit more about, uh, who in partnership with um, the Information Law and Policy Center and Dr. Nora Nilijan uh, co-hosts this, uh, this event. So uh, just to introduce the project very shortly, I will uh, share a few slides with you. Just bear with me, hopefully this works. Okay, seems to be working. Uh, so our project Cross DPN, Cross Border Data Protection Network, is uh, funded by the uh, ESRC, Economic and Social Research Council, and the Irish Research Council. It's a multi-stakeholder network that looks into the future of data protection and data transfers in particular, and we aim to gather researchers, practitioners, and civil society uh, from the UK, the Republic of Ireland, the EU, and more widely. Uh, this is the theme, just, uh, just a brief introduction to, to uh, Dr. Eduardo Celeste, Roshin uh, Costello, and Dr. Napoleon Zampolis. They are from um, two Irish and two, two uh, UK researchers uh, coming from Dublin City University, Aston, and the University of Port. So you can see here our institutions that I have already mentioned. And the partners, of course, the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies and the Information Law and Policy Center, as well as the King's College um, Law Center for European Studies. And in addition to this event, we're also organizing three other events that you are welcome to join, of course. And uh, the, the next one is on the 23rd of, of June, and it, uh, the topic you, you can see on the slide. And then we have two further events uh, by the end of this year that, again, uh, we, we would welcome you uh, and um, appreciate your contributions. Okay, so you can see our Twitter handle here and the website in case you would like to, to know more about the project. Okay, so um, just a few information about our format today. Uh, I, would, um, I will introduce uh, speakers individually in, in their order, and they will have about uh, 20 minutes to, to talk. And after each speaker, we will allow for five minutes uh, for, for questions from the floor. And then uh, hopefully, if we have some time left at the end, we will also allow for additional questions. Of course, you're welcome to join uh, to, to join us in the second part of this event, uh, starting at 1 p.m., where you can again engage with stakeholders and different perspectives on these issues coming from a range of uh, governments, civil society, um, and practitioners' um, angles. So um, you, you do have a chat function available in this event, so, so please do ask questions and write comments there. I will keep in my uh, I'll be keeping my eye on the chat. Also, the Q&A function where we would um, hopefully, well, we would prefer to have questions. So if you could, if, if you could use the, the Q&A, uh, that would be great. So I think that was all in terms of the introductions and the format. And I will now introduce our first speaker. And our first speaker is Dr. Karen McCalla from the University of um, East Anglia. And she will be talking um, about the post-Brexit data protection in the UK and uh, leaving the EU, but not the EU data protection law behind, as the title of her talk states. Uh, Dr. Karen McCalla is a non-practicing solicitor. She's qualified and practiced law in Northern Ireland before entering academia. Whilst undertaking postgraduate studies, Karen held a lectureship at University of Salford and was employed as a teaching assistant at the University of Manchester Research Assistant at Queen's University, Belfast. Karen holds both a PhD and the MSc in Social Research Methods and Statistics from the University of Manchester. She also holds an LLM in Computer and Law, LLB Honours in Law and PG Cert in Professional Legal Studies, Solicitor, from Queen's Mary University, Belfast. Her research specialism is information rights, both the commercial and the fundamental rights aspects of privacy and data protection and freedom of information is an as aspect of public law. Uh, she won various awards and prizes and I am really, really honored and pleased to be able to, to host Karen today and um, to, to present her take on, on these issues. Karen, um, your 20 minutes, please.
sorry, I'm just uh, uploading my slides, if you give me a second. Um, sure. Thank you. So hopefully, is that sharing them? It is, yes. Uh, so if I go to presenter view, you should be able to see them now. That's perfect, thank you. Okay, so thank you for that very detailed um, introduction, Adina. Um, so yes, I'm here to talk to you all about post-Brexit data protection in the UK and uh, try and encourage you to think that we're leaving the EU, but not EU data protection law behind. And so the purpose of this talk is to bring you back to um, that pre-COVID time when our primary concern was uh, trade relations with the EU and data protection relations with the EU following the referendum that the UK held in 2016. So it seems like a long time ago, particularly as we're all now um, engrossed with all things COVID, but back in 2016, uh, the UK held a referendum um, in which the uh, voters were asked to choose whether they wanted to remain in the EU or to leave the European Union. And somewhat unexpectedly, the Leave vote won the referendum. And the unexpected outcome is important because it means that the UK didn't actually, the UK government didn't actually have a plan in mind, didn't have a strategy didn't have an agreed vision as to what kind of trading relationship it would like to forge with the UK if it did leave, um, and nor did it have in mind um, a particular specificities regarding what kind of data protection relationship it would like to have with the EU um, if we became a third country for data protection purposes. So there's a bit of turmoil in the aftermath of the referendum. Um, and if you take a look at that slide in front of you, you'll see that we had the referendum in June 2016. Um, by the end of March 2017, the then Prime Minister, Theresa May, had sent a letter to Donald Tusk, President of the uh, European Council or Commission, um, triggering Article 50. Um, so we embarked on the process of leaving the European Union whilst having internal discussions about the nature and degree of trading relationship that we want to have with the EU and the um, data protection arrangements that we want to keep in place. And uh, we had to, because of that, we had to quite quickly make up our mind regarding what kind of uh, data protection relationship we'd like to have, both in the short term and in the longer term. And in the short term, we really had to decide quite quickly because as you can see on the slide, the um, general data protection regulation was due to uh, become directly applicable in EU member states as of the 25th of May 2018. So the UK had to make an immediate decision. What was it going to do in relation to, to data protection during the um, post-referendum period, during the period of negotiations with the EU? And we decided to retain, or sorry, we decided to enact the Data Protection Act 2018 um, to repeal and replace the um, Data Protection Act from 1998 because we knew that the GDPR was going to become directly applicable in an EU member state. And the UK decided that it wanted to continue to comply with the GDPR for at least the short term period for three reasons. So the first reason was legal necessity. So the UK government knew that the GDPR would supersede Directive 9546 EC and be directly applicable in all member states and EEA countries, including the UK from the 25th of May until the end of the transition period, um, which eventually happened uh, on the 31st of December 2020. So we had a legal obligation to comply with it because failure to give effect to the GDPR and to fully comply with it would have left the UK in breach of its legal obligations. Um, and the biggest threat there would have been disruption to personal data flows between EEA countries and UK, the UK, which is vital to our economy. That brings us into the second factor, which is economic necessity. So the UK government knew that the UK's economy had become more service-based in recent decades, and we knew that much of the service industry activity is reliant on personal data flows. And the majority of those data flows come from EEA countries. So to avoid economic disruption, 
we also decided to continue to comply with the GDPR. And the third factor, third um, explanation for continuing to comply with the GDPR in the um, short term is because, as I mentioned before, we hadn't got a plan in mind when we held a referendum, so we didn't have an alternative ready to roll out. And because we didn't have an alternative ready to roll out, the easiest solution was to maintain the status quo um, until the UK government had the opportunity to evaluate the merits of diverging from the GDPR. And this is particularly important because um, the GDPR was going to have extra extraterritorial application um, when it comes to uh, data controllers in the UK processing um, personal data from individuals in the EU and EEA countries. So we were going to have to comply with the GDPR um, until we decided um, that we were, uh, until we made up our mind what we were going to do. So for legal necessity, economic necessity, and because of a lack of alternative uh, options and the extraterritorial application of the GDPR, it made sense for the UK to take steps to implement the um, GDPR through the uh, Data Protection Act um, being introduced to facilitate derogations that, um, in compliance with it. As for what happened during the um, transition or implementation period, so the UK refers to it as a transition period, sorry, the EU refers to it as a transition period, the UK refers it to it as an implementation period. That period was to last from the 31st of January until the 31st of December 2020. Um, and it was agreed in the withdrawal agreement that the GDPR would continue to apply in the UK during that period. This was to facilitate personal data transfers between the EEA countries and the UK. And so what the parties agreed was the data received from the UK would not be treated any differently to data received from EU member states, even though the UK had by that stage technically left the UK. So what we have in place at this stage is a GDPR envelope. So the GDPR envelope um, applies to personal data that is processed in the UK during the transition period and which continues to be processed after that period if it's not uh, supplanted by an adequacy decision by then. So what we're trying to ensure, what the EU is trying to ensure is that the protection that is afforded to EU data um, uh, continues and carries across to the UK in the event that it is transferred to the UK. Um, so in the interest of continuity, um, seamless continuity of arrangements, the withdrawal agreement stipulated that the CJEU would continue to have jurisdiction to settle questions of interpretation that might be raised by the UK courts regarding data protection and that the um, UK would uh, continue to comply with um, EU law uh, in this matter. And it is so the, uh, the UK is continuing to take advantage of um, the arrangements that were in place, for example, the one stop shop principle is available to the UK during the transition period. And we were able to continue to designate the UK National Supervisory Authority, that is the Information Commissioner's Office, um, as the lead supervisory regarding cross-border processing, so they could investigate in the event of a complaint. But there's one thing to notice here, and that is that Chapter 7 of the GDPR did not continue to apply um, under the terms of the withdrawal agreement. So that meant that the ICO ceased to be a full member with full voting rights of the European Data Protection Board. So one of the key consequences of becoming a third country is that the UK starts to lose regulatory influence. The ICO is relegated to an observer, so it can attend meetings that is invited to, but it cannot directly seek to influence the uh, agenda and direction of data protection law. But from a business perspective, these transitional measures were welcomed because it uh, ensured the continued um, and seamless uh, transfers of data between EEA countries and the UK 
which was uh, brilliant for economic purposes. It avoided any disruption. Um, so the, the legal certainty and the economic certainty was appreciated by businesses. So during this period, um, the UK government was hearing evidence um, in various government committees regarding the future direction of the GDPR. And if you think back to 2016, 2017, 2018, we will recall that there was a lot of talk about the UK wanting to forge a looser trading relationship with the European Union, and as well as forging looser trading relationships, um, there was a lot of rhetoric about wanting to free the UK from the shackles of EU law, free the UK from the oversight by EU institutions, and in particular, free the UK from the jurisdiction of the Court of Justice of the European Union. So there was a suggestion that what the UK should do is that the UK should um, seek not only to have looser trade arrangements, but also to have looser data protection arrangements. Um, and so what you saw happening during that period was uh, an, uh, several proposals that um, the UK should seek to diverge in terms of data protection. But those proposals were not fleshed out in terms of what that divergence would look like, um, either in terms of format or the substantive provisions that would be in um, the equivalent UK data protection law. At the same time, what was also happening was that the UK government committees were hearing evidence from legal experts and also from trade representatives. And what you started to see happening was when the trade representatives would um, give evidence, they would um, make a case for continued compliance and alignment with the GDPR. So if you take a look on the slide, you see there is a quote from Anthony Walker from Tech UK. So uh, a business representative in the UK um, representing lots of the tech industries. And he made the important point that if you're running a global operation, what you want is consistent processes in place across your businesses. And he went on to say that what we are seeing is that global firms based outside of the EU are taking the GDPR as their norm for their businesses and are building their processes around it. So for very large companies, there is no desire to diverge from the GDPR. In fact, the opposite is happening because they worry about falling between the gaps. And this very much fits into the regulatory theory that Bradford has espoused, which is known as the Brussels effect. And the Brussels effect is the idea of a race to the top facilitated by trade power and legal power. So we've mentioned that the GDP, sorry, I've mentioned that the GDPR has extraterritorial application. So Article 3, as you're all very familiar with, says that if you are uh, anywhere in the world and that you are offering goods or services to individuals in EU countries or you're monitoring their activities, then in certain circumstances you will be required to comply with the GDPR. So that's the legal element of the Brussels effect. The economic element or the trade power uh, element of the Brussels effect is that if you're a multinational company operating across various different legal jurisdictions, then what you will do is seek to comply with the most stringent um, requirements in all jurisdictions because that makes compliance easier for your company so you look around the various jurisdictions in the world, you work out which one is most stringent, and then you set that as your internal baseline within your company. And that's what we see happening with multinationals across the world. They are setting the GDPR as their norm, and they are uh, wanting to minimize compliance burdens. So we're saying, well, if we're complying with the GDPR, let's keep that in place across the world. So we saw that kind of comment coming in um, in relation to uh, UK companies. UK companies were not immediately seeking for divergence because continued alignment suited their business and compliance needs. Um, and in terms of whether there was an actual appetite for uh, immediately diverging, it's fair to say that there wasn't. 
because if you take a look at this quote also from Anthony Walker, he said, we have to remember the size of the UK market versus the size of the European market. So you're saying, look, we have far fewer customers in the European, sorry, we have far fewer customers in the UK market compared to the European market. We're naturally going to comply with the standard in the European market because of the Article 3 requirements and because it's the most stringent standard. So he was saying that we'll have to do um, work very much in partnership with the European Union rather than boldly striking out by ourselves and hoping that others will follow. So you can see that the um, initial reaction from UK businesses and multinationals is we want to continue to comply with the GDPR rather than to immediately seek to diverge. But you'll recall that a few moments ago, I mentioned that there was quite a bit of political rhetoric uh, regarding the need to make the most of uh, leaving the European Union in terms of divergence from EU institutions, freeing ourselves from the oversight mechanisms and so on. So we ended up with this interesting tension because we had the economic actors, the businesses calling for continued compliance. And at the same time, we also had uh, several strong voices within government calling for regulatory divergence and in particular to free ourselves from oversight of EU institutions or oversight by EU institutions and in particular the Court of Justice of the European Union. Um, and so that led to the UK attempting to pursue a strategy of exceptionalism. So for over a year, the UK repeatedly made proposals that what we should do is that the UK should seek to incorporate data protection provisions within any trade agreement that was eventually negotiated. Um, and if we were able to achieve that, that would free the UK from the normal process of seeking an adequacy decision. There were several reasons why the UK wanted to pursue this exceptionalism strategy. First, for political ends. So it fitted with the, the narrative of leaving the EU and its institutions behind. But there was also a second reason, and that would have been because uh, the UK would have known that um, if it had applied for an adequacy decision, that that could have had implications in terms of a finding of adequacy. So for example, when you are um, an EU member state, and uh, national security is a matter for an, uh, a member state, and the um, Court of Justice of the European Union has limited ability in terms of oversight regarding national se security matters, particularly those pertaining to surveillance. And the UK knew that that could potentially be problematic, and that if it was problematic, it could lead to the European Commission deciding not to make a finding of adequacy. And if the European Commission didn't make a finding of adequacy, then that would mean that the UK would not have um, the ability to have seamless flows of personal data transfers. It would have to seek to rely on uh, derogations. It would have to seek to rely on other transfer mechanisms such as standard contractual clauses and binding corporate rules and so on. All of those are more costly and cumbersome to implement and not necessarily suited to um, a large chunk of the UK's economy, which is um, small and medium sized enterprises. And two the, minutes, Karen, sorry. So how many? About two, let's say. About two minutes. So the UK made a strong case for um, pursuing um, bespoke arrangements, but eventually the UK realized that it was going to have to concede on the point of adequacy, and it did concede and it did apply for an adequacy decision. And what you see um, in place then is the UK deciding to apply for an adequacy decision. As you, those of you who've been paying attention know, the trade and cooperation agreement was finally um, uh, achieved between the uh, UK and the EU a mere seven days before we were crashed out without a, a deal in place. So we have um, the trade and cooperation agreement in place but it's silent on the issue of um, an advocacy decision because the advocacy decision is deliberately kept separate during trade negotiations to ensure that data protection 
provisions cannot be weakened um, during any negotiations. We have transitional measures in place and what they really are is the um, the, the EU general data protection regulation is continuing to have effect in the UK. The UK has decided not to make any changes um, whilst the adequacy assessment is ongoing so that they stand a good chance of uh, receiving a finding of adequacy. Are we nearly there yet in terms of receiving an adequacy decision? Well, we're, we're quite a bit along the process. So the European Commission issued a draft adequacy decision um, in February of this year, uh, last week, the European Data Protection Board issued an opinion in which it was uh, giving general overall approval to the advocacy decision, but noting certain issues that it had concerns with and that it requested further review of or strong monitoring of. Um, and we're now waiting on the European Parliament to make a resolution. But we are expecting to have an adequacy decision in place by um, the end of June. Whether the adequacy decision will be a stable mechanism is um, uncertain. You'll see here that I have said that it's potentially an unstable uh, mechanism for, for the reasons listed. So, for example, if the European Commission doesn't address the concerns that have been raised by the European Data Protection Board and the Parliament, then there is a likelihood that someone will pursue a SREMS type um, complaint in the future. So there could be a legal challenge to the adequacy decision in the future. It could be struck down. And you'll see also that I've mentioned that the UK has repeatedly mentioned an intention to diverge. And if it does diverge and that divergence is substantive, then that could mean that the uh, periodic reviews of the UK adequacy decision do not lead to a renewal. So it is, in my view, a potentially um, unstable mechanism. Where we're at in terms of post-transition data protection in the UK is we basically took a snapshot of the EU GDPR, we converted it to the UK GDPR, we renamed all institutions that had the word EU in it to relevant UK measures. And we are um, continuing to keep that in place, not only to facilitate the um, advocacy decision, decision itself, but to make life easier for businesses. And the interesting point is that it does also allow the UK to assess adequacy of third countries in the future. Um, and of course, what I would like you to keep in mind is if we're going to try and retain an EU adequacy decision, then we're going to have to find third countries adequate on the same criteria as you would if you're making an EU adequacy decision. So they are very similar at the moment. They're basically a snapshot of each other. The, they are likely to continue to remain the same for a long period of time if the UK wants to continue to receive adequacy renewals in the future. And my final slide, Adina will be pleased to note, is that I would say that there are some calls for divergence from the GDPR, but that some of those calls are perhaps a misconstrual of the, the nature of the GDPR. So for example, in recent months, we have heard claims that the GDPR is not fit for purpose because it doesn't facilitate research on COVID or it's not fit for purpose because it doesn't allow people to work from home, um, that it's not fit for purpose because it's too onerous for small and medium-sized enterprises. And actually, if you take a look, these issues are common across EU member states and also in the UK. And what is needed is for greater, um, greater work to be done to open up the white spaces that are in the GDPR itself. So for example, the derogations, to make the most of the derogations um, and to, to unlock the potential that the GDPR allows. There is a lot of white space. There is a lot of scope for member states um, and third countries, including the UK, to interpret and apply the data protection legislation in a way that suits its economy. Uh, because of the extraterritorial um, provisions in the GDPR, I don't think the UK is going to be making any case to leave it anytime soon, provided it continues to meet our economic needs. And I think it does because of the white space in the GDPR or in the UK GDPR. And I shall stop talking and apologize for going over my allocated time. 
Uh, no worries. Thanks very much, Karen, for this fascinating uh, and really informative and detailed talk about the process and uh, where we are and where we could be. So we do have, I think I'll allow one question now that, that uh, popped up in the uh, Q&A. I will read it out, I think. Uh, it's a question from Jia Hong Chen, and he asks, asks you, Karen, uh, if there's anything in the trade agreement that might have implications for the CJEU's ability to scrutinize the adequacy decision by examining the UK's national security law. By examining the UK's national security law? Um, so uh, I think I was trying to hint at that at one of my final slides where I'm saying uh, the trade and cooperation agreement very much keeps uh, data protection as a separate issue. And so we have this um, adequacy assessment ongoing at the moment. Um, and uh, the issue is whether the commission is taking due regard of the issues that have been uh, raised regarding um, national security matters, surveillance matters. And if it doesn't, then we are likely to see um, a challenge brought before the CJEU in the normal way. So I don't think the trade and cooperation agreement excludes oversight by the CJEU. The adequacy decision uh, will be dealt with in the standard way. The standard CJEU oversight will apply in due course. Okay, that's great. Thanks a lot, Karen, for your for your talk and your answer. So we can, of course, continue the conversation if uh, if the if the participants wish in in chat. But we'll now move on to our next speaker, and I will introduce my dear colleague, Dr. Henry Pierce from the University of Portsmouth. Uh, Dr. Henry Pierce is a senior lecturer in law at the University of Portsmouth and deputy editor for Computer Law and Security Review a major platform for the publication of high quality research and legal analysis in the field of IT law and computer security. His research primarily focuses on the development of data protection law and policy, both nationally and internationally, and he's widely published in the field. His recent work um, has focused particularly on the regulation of posthumous medical data donation, something that I'm uh, really uh, Keener as well, data licensing, the data disclosure practices of public authorities, and the interplay between data protection law and other areas of law, such as administrative law and freedom of information law. And his talk today is entitled Data Protection Law in a po Post-Brexit World. The future is not personal. That's intriguing. I'm looking forward to hearing Henry's, Henry's talk. Henry? Thank you very much and um, thank you for that excellent introduction and thank you to Karen for uh, providing that excellent overview of the, uh, the, the Brexit data protection timeline and where we've come from uh, and where we, where we now are. My talk, which um, I shall just attempt to share, share my screen and uh, slides, is more... Um, <clears throat> theoretical, I think we can say, and, and speculative. And having heard from Karen about where we've come to up to now, my um, focus of my talk will be to talk about where we, we may go in the future. So uh, to, to just recap what um, the current situation is, uh, where Karen uh, left off, uh, as we heard, um, on the 19th of February, of this year, the European Commission published two draft adequacy decisions for transfers of personal data from the EU to the UK. Last week, the European Data Protection Board adopted its opinion on the draft adequacy decisions, and these will now be um, formally adopted if they are approved by EU member states. So, now that the UK has left the EU, it has the legislative freedom to diverge from EU data protection rules, and the UK government has recently signalled its intention to do so. There's been quite a lot of rhetoric regarding how the UK no longer needs to follow the GDPR word for word or, or uh, <clears throat> other EU rules relating to data governance and free flows of information and so on. And this has quite predictably sparked concerns that the UK may use its new legislative freedom to adopt standards of data protection that are lower than the minimum required by the GDPR, and perhaps particularly in relation to international data transfers. 
So there is possibly a, a fairly chaotic situation and uh, a troublesome situation brewing. <clears throat> Pardon me. Henry, can I just, sorry to interrupt you. We, uh, we can see your uh, notes in the next slide. So if you just go full screen, just on the... Oh, uh, okay. Um, Maybe this display settings or... Uh, give me a second. Because we can see two slides, the next slide and the notes, if any. There are no notes at the moment. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, da, 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 da. If I share... Hi, my... Hide presenter view and what you were just doing. What you just clicked ah. on. Yeah, oh, oh, when you just right clicked a second ago. Okay, no, it's gone now. Um, <clears throat> right. Is that better? That's perfect. That's great. Thank you. Sorry. That's better. Okay. There we go. Uh, right. So, so yeah, this is quite this, um, all this rhetoric that we've been hearing from the uh, UK government has sparked concerns that the UK may use its uh, uh, post-Brexit legislative freedom to start tinkering with um, the UK's own data protection legislation in a way that will uh, result in a reduction of data protection standards. And this is a, a fairly chaotic situation uh, that is perhaps brewing now. However, where there is chaos, there is also opportunity. Um, and I'll preface what I'm about to say by just going back in time a bit and taking us back to the, uh, the repeal of the Data Protection Directive and the enactment of the, the GDPR. This whole process of reform arguably represented a great opportunity for data protection law to evolve and develop. Instead, what we ended up with in the, the UK, the Data Protection Act 2018, was arguably just and is arguably just the old Data Protection Act 1998 with some bells and whistles on it and hasn't taken us very far. There are some new rights, perhaps some new criminal offences as well that have been introduced. But substantively, this is not a fundamentally, uh, it's not a fundamental evolution in data protection legislation. The legislative freedom brought about by Brexit, however, has presented us with another opportunity to think creatively about novel and innovative ways through which data protection law can evolve. And there are several um, interesting ways we can do that. What I'm going to focus on here is the concept of, of personal data and how perhaps we can move beyond a, a model of data protection that is personal data based, if, if that makes sense. So as we know, data protection law um, is based around the concept of personal data. It is data protection law's central concept. The substantive terms of the GDPR and the Data Protection Act apply to the processing of personal data only and not to any other kinds of data. So not to anonymous data or, or non-personal data. However, there are numerous reasons why this model of data protection uh, is perhaps outdated or unfit for purpose or just simply not sustainable. And I've broken, um, broken these concerns down into two strands in my mind, which are um, practical issues with the personal data concept, but also conceptual issues. So if we start by talking about the practical problems with this concept of personal, uh, personal data, uh, I think an obvious place to start with this is to just think about how the emergence of technologies such as big data analytics and other, other things along those lines has fundamentally eroded the binary split between data that are personal and data that are supposedly anonymous. Many types of data that were previously thought of as uh, non-personal have been shown to be capable of identifying people if they are processed or analyzed in a certain way. And the idea that personal data can be rendered completely anonymous through the use of anonymization techniques has been shown to be completely false. Um, personal data, as we know, is information that relates to a, a person, but nearly everything in the world 
either is or contains information. Information is a nebulous concept. And if personal data is defined in um, the way it currently is, this potentially means that it could eventually end up applying to literally everything. Data uh, are generally thought to relate to a person when the use of those data are used to evaluate a person or treat them in a certain way. And the number of data processing activities in the world today that can be described in this way is continuing to grow massively. So particular examples we can think of of uh, processing activities in this vein could be uh, processing associated with smart devices, location-based services, social media, mobile applications, online shops, and so on and so on. In the not too distant future, with the emergence of smart cities and smart vehicles and other smart environments, a huge proportion of our external environments and therefore our entire lives will operate in this way, meaning that the processing of personal data will be literally nearly everywhere. So data protection, or as I say, uh, could end up applying to nearly every, everything and become impossible to enforce. So the quote on the slide at the bottom here was uh, taken from um, a conversation I had with a contact of mine at the Information Commissioner's Office, the ICO, uh, where they said the whole world is getting more and more unclear, which is odd as ordinarily you would expect the introduction of some new law to make things clearer. It seems to me that as time goes on, we are essentially going in reverse. And this quote has stayed with me. Um, this is a conversation we had some time ago, but I think it, it, it does neatly sum up a lot of issues we're facing at the moment. Working out when data are personal and when they are not is in many instances becoming an incredibly complicated task. Data protection law is emerging uh, more and more into this legal monolith of, of huge complexity. And moving forward, that may have severe problems for its smooth operation and, and um, application. The term personal data, however, is in itself also conceptually problematic, I think, as well as practically problematic. Um, this, this term, this, this word personal, implies that some types of information will relate to us exclusively uh, or relate to individual persons exclusively. It also implies that errant uses of that information will be of significant only to such persons. And it allows us and encourages us to think of such data as somehow being ours, uh, of, of belonging to us almost. It, it has fostered this individual, individualistic conception of data protection law that in many ways I think is, is becoming divorced from reality. So uh, our personal data are frequently and inevitably in connect, interconnected with the personal data of others in, in many notable ways. For instance, uh, birth certificates, electoral registers, medical records, wills and trusts, social media contact lists. These are all examples of, of uh, things, for lack of a better word, where our personal data will end up being interconnected with the personal data of others and intermingled. Um, but we can also point to the fact that our personal data are constantly shaped by external environments. So for instance, a person's location data perhaps will be altered and affected if they are forced to move house due to um, the house being flooded or, or knocked down by an earthquake or something like that, let's say. Uh, and on top of this, the processing of one person's personal data or of data that is not personal in any, uh, according to the legal definition, may have possibly harmful consequences for other individuals or, or groups. And again, uh, big data analytics operations are perhaps a prime example of that. So. The traditional vision of personal data, that uh, personal data are data that are ours and concern only ourselves in, in many circumstances, I think, simply not borne out in practice. In reality, the state and condition of our personal data as defined in the GDPR will often depend heavily on external conditions and on interconnections with the personal data of others and uses of data about us may have harmful consequences for others. So um, apologies if anybody heard that. My dog is just next to me snoring heavily. Um, it's, a, it's a hard life. Uh, 
But anyway, the point I'm making here is that if personal data are to some extent personal in name only, and individuals can be harmed by data processing activities that, that do not involve their own personal data, or perhaps no personal data of anybody at all, does it really make sense for personal data to remain the central trigger around which all, uh, all data protection rules and rights are based? At this point, I feel the need to, to make a disclaimer, um, as having made this, ask, uh, this argument to, to various people before, I've been accused of being almost heretical in, in, um, in my views. My point here is absolutely not to challenge the idea or the notion that nominally personal data, as, as per the legal definition, comprise an important aspect of our identities. I think they absolutely do. However, while such data represent us and are a part of us, there are evidently notable practical and ethical problems with the whole personal data concept. My point today really is just to make the, to float the idea that we've now arrived at a time where there is a great opportunity to develop a more realistic, flexible and sustainable way of thinking about what should, what falls within data protection law scope and what the law should, should hope to achieve. In terms of um, possible ways forward and, and where there may be an opportunity to really develop the law, instead of the law continuing to focus on the processing of personal data, data protection law could perhaps be remodeled to focus on data related harms. So in other words, rather than establishing rules that apply to all and every act of personal data processing, some of which arguably may be completely uh, benign and, and should, should fall outside the scope of the law completely. The law should instead focus on specific data process processing activities, whether they involve um, personal data or not, that are likely to be particularly harmful or have serious consequences for any of individuals who may be affected. This suggestion, um, I'm aware, is perhaps very problematic in itself. For, in, for example, the notion of harms itself will be likely would be very contentious, obviously. Um, but for the reasons I've mentioned already, I think there are compelling reasons for why the law regarding uses of information, uh, and this goes beyond just data protection law and perhaps encompasses other areas of law like freedom of information. Uh, there are reasons for thinking why law regarding information and data gov governance are, are in need of a fundamental rethink. Uh, and this way forward, looking to a harms or purposes based approach is one possible way, uh, one possible option for how this could be done that I think would be particularly interesting to think more about. Um, looking to the future, if you were to ask me, do I think I have any, uh, would I be confident that we would get any kind of reform like this? I would say no, absolutely not. Unfortunately, I, I don't have a lot of optimism for um, innovative outside of the box reform and ways of thinking about these things. Um, the UK government has made various promises to not water down data protection rules, but the clear example of government rhetoric is that um, in, in the, the field of information use and uh, data flows and so on, uh, the UK government's main priority is the digital economy. I don't think there is any significant appetite for, um, well, for data protection generally amongst the people who are calling the shots. But as I say, I, I am very sceptical that the, the current personal data based and focused model of data protection is is sustainable uh, or workable in the long term. And I think we do need to start thinking about new and innovative ways forward for how we can reform data protection law and, and m ensure it, it remains fit for purpose. And even whether this area of law should, um, should remain to be called data protection even, or whether in fact it should end up being called something else. 
but three anyway, minutes, Henry. Sorry. Um, that's perfect because actually I'm I I am done. <laughs> oh. I've, I've run out of things to say. So thank you. That that was well timed. Uh, thank you very much. I will I will leave it there. I'll stop talking now. Uh, that was excellently timed. <laughs> Thank you so much, Henry. So we do have then uh, time for more questions for Henry. So um, there was a question in Q&A for Karen, and Karen uh, has just kindly, kindly answered the question in chat. So I encourage the person who asked the question to, to um, see the chat. Uh, do we have questions for Henry? I don't see anything at the moment in Q&A or or the chat, let me just scroll. No, not yet. It, does anyone volunteer? If not, I will ask the first question and abuse my privilege. Okay, so uh, it's, a, it's not a short question, but just I'll, tr I'll try to summarize it. So when you, when you speak about uh, moving away from the individualistic perception of data protection, uh, and um, creating a new framework that would be that would rely on more sort of communitarian and other interests, isn't it? Uh, how would that fit then within? Well, um, I would argue very individualistic framework of human rights law more generally, where the data protection, especially in the EU, uh, belongs to as as an area. So how how much uh, reconceptualization would that require and actually a paradigm shift, or would that uh, fit within the, the human rights framework more broadly in your view, your, your um, suggestion? <clears throat> I, th I think fitting this, what I've proposed in with the kind of the, the, the I can't remember the term you use now, but the, the, yeah, the very human rights collectivist sort of um, situation, let's call it that. Uh, particularly within within Europe, would be would be very difficult. It, it would be. I'm very much aware that what I've proposed, I don't think, would sit easily with with how things are. It would be a fundamental um, shift that would be meet a lot of resistance, and it's it's certainly not. I I certainly do not instinctively have any problem with ind the individualist ethic as a from a purely ethical point of view. The problem I have primarily. Um, when it comes to data protection is simply, well, a large part of it anyway, is that the idea that the law must regulate everything to do with the processing of personal data is, is not a sustainable model. It, it will become inoperable after a while. And I think data protection, or to some extent, has become a bit lost in what it's trying to achieve by, by focusing primarily on personal data and individual harms it is um, it is easy to see why often I think people end up perhaps unfairly a lot of the time, but it, uh, there is an explanation here for why data protection rules become viewed as a bureaucratic hindrance. So, um, for example, if if I take a picture of somebody celebrating on New Year's Eve, they're I don't know, they're in the background and possibly identifiable. Am I, am I really processing their personal data? Is, is the law really designed to start applying to these sorts of activities when in, in actuality there are processing, if data protection law is there to pr protect people, let's say, against uh, data processing related harms, why is it applying to, to that sort of situation? But there's a, a load of processing of non-personal data going on somewhere else that is actually seriously harmful, that is outside the scope of the law. Um, so I think some sort of risk-based approach to data protection is, is necessary if the, uh, the, the fundamental aims of what data protection law is meant to do are, are to, be, to be met. Removing the kind of personal data focus from data protection law would, however, yeah, be very controversial. I, I can't really, <laughs> uh, can't really deny that. But I think, uh, and unless we do have, we do start to think about quite new, innovative, and outside of the box ways forward, we are going to, before long, end up in a, a very uh, 
I mean, data protection law, people in the 90s were saying it was already too complex. And now here we are, um, yeah, close to the quarter of a century later, and it's, it's only going in one direction. I'm yeah, not sure if I've answered your question there. Sorry. You have. You ha well, you have actually. Don't get me wrong. I'm coming from, from this uh, stance as, as well and, and proposing very controversial proposals in my research that many people <laughs> would disagree or would not fit within the traditional paradigms. We do have an, another question in the Q&A from Carolyn, and she asks, what do you think data protection should be aiming to regulate or not regulate? Um, I, I think... The aims of uh, data protection law as present are, are appropriate. I, th I think, that the, in my mind anyway, that the rationale and reason why we have legislation of this type at all is to prevent harms and um, undesirable consequences arising out of the use of, of information and, and data. The issue I have, I think, is that by focusing only on personal data, the law is in danger of, of um, putting its focus in the wrong place, essentially. It's no longer a case of whether it is personal data being involved or, or not, I don't think, or at least in many such circumstances, it's not. Because some, some um, processing of personal data, like I say, the, the example of taking a photo of, of a photograph of somebody on New Year's Day, are totally benign. So just because you're using personal data doesn't mean it's harmful necessarily. Um, and flip, flipped around, just because you're using data that are not personal, that doesn't guarantee the uses are not harmful. So I think the aim of, of um, data protection or should aim to guard against harms related to uses of certain types of information, whether it's automated uses or, 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 or other types, but focusing Make, making data, personal data the central trigger, the, the central focus, the, the only focus really is, um, looking for an expression, it's, it's, not, um, it's not putting the cart before the horse, but it's, it's, it's putting all your eggs in one basket, the wrong basket perhaps, I think. Sorry, Henry, there is one more question in the Q&A, and then Boyana would also like to, to ask her question. So let me just uh, read out the question uh, in the Q&A from Perry. Um, they say, thank you, Harry, uh, Henry. Do you see data protection law being gradually overtaken by emerging AI governance? I'm sure Michael will have a lot to say in the next talk. Uh, rules that render its purposes and processes increasingly relevant over time. Hmm, it's... Um... Yeah, I, I could see that, I think. Um, I, I, I'm not, AI is not necessarily a, an area in which I have a, a huge amount of expertise, but a lot of um, <clears throat> the, the processing, data processing operations that are perhaps the most harmful and, and threatening are those undertaken by AI and um, <clears throat> linked to things like yeah, algorithms and machine learning and things like that. And we are definitely seeing more calls for bespoke regulatory regimes to emerge to specifically deal with those kind of things. So it might be, I mean, I think there's overlap is absolutely inevitable. And over time, yeah, perhaps it could be that regulating AI, let's say we have, uh, yeah, some kind of AI GDPR <laughs> or, or other regulation emerging in, in place of, uh, to either complement or perhaps even supersede data protection rules. It's entirely possible. Yeah, I, d I don't see why not. Or just the new AI regulation adopted in the next three to five years. But I'm sure Michael will refer to it. Um, I will ask now Boyana just to, to um, ask a question or, or comment. Thank you. Thank you, Edina, very much. Um, so I was trying to ask a question in Q&A, but for some reason, because I'm speaking later, I can't. I'm just um, doing it in chat. So, Henry, I actually really agree with you completely that um, this vast way in which we regulate all personal data is unsustainable and that we have to move to the harms-based, the risk-based approach or, or, or focus on the use of data, right? Um, and. Uh, but but, but I, I'm a little bit more optimistic maybe than you. And, and so here is why. I think that um, a risk-based approach is already incorporated in GDPR. 
it's everywhere, right? Throughout the, the law, it also says in Article 24 that controllers can actually implement GDPR based on um, also risks and harms and severity likely to individuals. As for those of you who don't know, we at CIPL have been re writing a lot about risk-based approach over the years, a number of papers and trying to push all laws globally to be more risk-based. So I actually think we have an opportunity here. The ICO has certain opportunities to implement, interpret and also enforce the law in a more risk-based approach than technical breach of any personal data use. And certainly the government can kind of emphasize and push that perhaps through these white spaces as well. So I'm a little bit more optimistic that we can do that. What do you think? I... <clears throat> I, I um, yeah, I, I certainly recognise that the, the GDPR, as it is at present, does allow for a risk-based um, approach to to considering whether data are personal or or, or not. For instance, um, it's definitely not a case of um, all data are definitely one hundred percent personal or or one hundred percent not not personal. The 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 issue I have with things are at, at, at present um, is that these these assessments of trying to work out a risk-based approach to whether data are personal or not can be hu hugely complicated, uh, particularly for organizations like pub public authorities when dealing with freedom of information requests, when they are asked, for instance, please can you disclose this anonymized data set relating to, I don't know, your employees or, or health records or something like that the uh, amount of expertise that is required to, to sort of work out even from the very beginning, let's say, is, is a certain data set an anonymized? Is it not? Is the personal data in here or is there isn't? What are the risks, if it is anonymized, what are the risks of uh, an intruder being able to de-anonymize the data set? This is a hugely complex um, operation. Uh, the, the, the concept of risk itself is obviously very uh, challenging as well. Uh, which which is would be a criticism of what I proposed too, um, because obviously different people have different ideas about the acceptability of levels of risk. The risk is a multi-dimensional concept in terms of probability and both uh, severity of harm. Um, <clears throat> and the, I, I suppose that the problem that I have is. In my mind, an axiom of good lawmaking and good governance is that the whoever to who to whomever it, the law applies should be able to understand and work within the law, um, understand what they need to do to comply with it without too much uh, difficulty. I think either the way, uh, when we start talking about risk-based approaches and the law as it is at the moment, I, I'm just not convinced people really understand how to comply with the law necessarily. It, it is an extremely complex area um, that's very burdensome that requires all sorts of uh, expertise even to um, comply with basic obligations really. And particularly with the public authorities that are very uh, cash strapped a lot of the time, like local councils, for instance, they simply don't have the uh, the, the money or the expertise to to fully meet their obligations. A conversation I had with somebody from a local council uh, who was responsible for uh, data protection a couple of months ago, I, I asked them, well, what what um, what is the general approach to, um, let's say, queries you get regarding freedom of information requests regarding supposedly anonymized data sets? And they basically shrugged their shoulders and said, well, it's, it's whatever my boss decides is probably right based on their understanding of the law and this person's not a lawyer at all so it, it all sounds very haphazard um and yeah, i think so, I've, I've rambled on again there so <laughs> sorry if sorry, I, your sorry. Uh, I think we'll have to continue this conversation either in chat and henry there are two questions in the q a for you as well so if you could please address them either there or in the chat that would be really helpful because we are running sure. out of time and I will have okay. to introduce Michael. Thanks a lot again for your fascinating and um, challenging talk. And we're now, and thanks for all your questions. That was a really interesting discussion. And uh, we'll move on uh, and I'll introduce uh, Dr. Michael Veal from UCL. 
Uh, Dr. Michael Veal is a lecturer in digital rights and regulation in the Faculty of Laws, UCL. He specializes in the intersection of law and policy and emerging dig digital technologies and infrastructure. He's, he has authored and co-authored reports for a wide range of organizations, including the Law Society of England and Wales, the Royal Society, the British Academy, and the Commonwealth Secretariat. Dr. Veal sits on the advisory council of the digital rights organizations, Foxglow and the Open Rights Group, and the um, Ada Lovelace Institute Rethinking Data Group. He was previously the uh, Digital Charter Fellow at the Turing Institute and the CMS. His talk is entitled, interestingly, Beyond Adequacy, Data Flows uh, in Infrastructural Return. Michael, please. Thanks, Adina. And let me know if this, yeah, if you can hear me okay. Um, is that fine? Yes, we can. Great. Um, so uh, thanks, everyone, and thanks for the talk so far. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, a different direction uh, than Henry did around going forwards, uh, data adequacy and data transfers, focusing on those in particular. Um, what we, uh, I'm not going to have slides, so I just want to you know, just sort of run through and I'll, hopefully I'll be, I'll be clear. So when we think about data transfers, um, you know, the, the key word there is transfer. Uh, the, the GDPR doesn't always govern um, and doesn't always trigger on the basis of transfers, doesn't tr between organizations or even within an organization. Uh, we have other definitions like, like processing, which is this huge definition, or controllership, which doesn't necessarily require being able to see data uh, and just exerting influence in different ways over the means and ends of processing. But a transfer is something quite particular. Transfer is a movement of data from one place to another. And in, in the case of, uh, of, of adequacy and, and similar conditions, uh, we're looking at uh, the transfer into different jurisdictions. Uh, when we look at the Schrems cases uh, in the history of data transfers, um, you know, we're, we see quite clear uh, concerns about transfer. Facebook Ireland, Facebook in, in the US, you know, data being uh, sort of very powerful, very good for analytics. You want to take it to engineers who can access it or use it, um, but often in Menlo Park on California in this case. And that indeed was the core of the concern is that in doing so, and in also uh, the fact that the services are delivered internationally, messages, people posting on each other's walls, sharing photos and all these things, whether it's being uh, different levels of public to private, all of this uh, was moved around the world and could have been slurped up as it was being by intelligence agencies. Um, and the intelligence agencies there were, uh, as, as we know from those cases, benefiting from the, the, the physical presence of, of data within their jurisdiction. That was how the PRISM system worked. So when we saw from the Snowden leaks, uh, the PRISM system really being uh, operates in a variety of ways but more or less you know, a kind of search engine into cloud services. Uh, the idea that uh, cloud services had to, within their own premises, install uh, hardware or software to enable access to data which had become physically present within the United States because data and the cloud do exist in physical locations. Today, that's made even more complicated because you have content delivery networks, things that bring data closer to the end user on the network to allow fast loading times, for example. Communications between people around the world, of course, do require data to be moved because you can't you can't um, uh, transmit information uh, without that. Um, uh, but there's actually some other important changes that we've maybe seen uh, since Snowden that require more emphasis, and they require us to consider um, new. Uh, uh, they require us to consider new um, uh, well, new considerations, really. Uh, around around what a data transfer means in practice. So uh, we've seen in parallel a few things. So uh, Dahi, who is, uh, I can't see, he's on the call in the middle, he's just like he's been replaced by a computer, um, has written about uh, the responsabilization of platforms and uh, new trends towards responsabilizing them. And that's happened uh, around the world. We've seen platforms uh, face new demands uh, to analyze content and, and to moderate content or to otherwise take responsibility over things that they uh, are hap happening on, on their servers. Um, and that's created a desire to move into the private space, to move into encrypted messaging, group messaging, to really blind content providers from this huge uh, array of content. I'm not going to use, you know, infodemic or, you know, what these other words that all describe like 
you know, there are a bazillion petabytes of information according to a flawed study from McKinsey. Um, uh, the the you know, the idea that there's a that, that platforms see this as a legal liability, so want to blind themselves to it. There's also social trends there. Individuals, I think, have become uh, a bit more private in their practices. Um, don't really want to connect with everybody in the world at once. Uh, try to curate, perhaps as they become much more confident with operating socially online, curate different groups of friends. Uh, and and, and uh, that's why I think we see group chats and things like that become really popular. And some countries, you know, what, WhatsApp and Telegram and so on groups are really huge. And, and you know, of course, within the sphere of disinformation, and misinformation, uh, viral content on WhatsApp groups is 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 really the the modus operandi rather than a sort of public page or a post or something like that. So this trend is happening too. And another kind of relation to that trend is that liability shields are faltering, are being ebbed away, are being uh, are being uh, cut away by case law, are being perhaps amended away uh, in some jurisdictions. Uh, of course, lots of debates in the US around what happens to Section 230 um, and in the Digital Services Act uh, in the EU, also some debates around uh, the exact nature of liability shields going forwards and various other legislation. So these trends have led to uh, platforms to adopt a few different practices that weren't really very present in the time of the Snowden leaks. These are uh, end-to-end -end encryption. It's familiar to most, uh, you know, the idea that you or a group of people can only read content that you're sending to each other on the device. And if you intercept it in the middle, you might know where it's going and you might be able to have a guess at its size, but you're not, be able to, you're not able to see too much else. And that's quite familiar. But there's another trend which is, is uh, growing in popularity among platforms in particular and has important relevance for data transfers, which is ed edge computing and federated learning. And some of you participants and in the, in the call will have, uh, will have, will have worked on this. Uh, a core idea of this is that instead of having uh, calculations be done in a centralized way on a cloud in order to achieve some largely collective objective, um, you know, say calculating the averages among hundreds of thousands of people, or indeed building machine learning models using that data, you do so in a way where the data doesn't really leave your device in a raw form. If it does, it might leave in a garbled form. Through communications between devices and sometimes between servers, you run a protocol, a computational protocol, that gives you the outputs that you might have got from centralizing a lot of data in a cloud server and then running calculations over it, but without ever having gone through that step. Uh, and privacy advocates, uh, particularly engineers in this space, uh, you know, uh, speak about this very positively in terms of privacy because of mathematical definitions of confidentiality. And these aren't the same kind of definitions that Henry was talking about where you say, well, everything can be de-anonymized. Um, that applies to when you've got data sets that you're trying to, to aggregate or, or distort in some way uh, to, to make less identifiable. But when you're actually operating with encrypted data, you're not statistically altering the information to try and make it less identifiable. You're actually garbling it and reconstructing it on the other end. Um, and so it's a different kind of data. This data can genuinely be seen as anonymous data while it's in transit. Uh, even if you were to gather and intercept huge amounts of this data, uh, you, through a network or an ISP, you wouldn't be able to, to reconstruct it to its original form. You might be able to get an idea of who's sending what to who, but you wouldn't be able to reconstruct the phenomena it's describing. So edge computing is important for companies um, because it allows them to, to effectively operate over this, this content that they are carrying as intermediaries without being uh, liable or without uh, assigning uh, obvious liability by virtue of being able to open and read it if they're asked. So they can tie themselves to the mast like Odysseus and see this content float around. Um, and they can monetize it, they can target adverts at people, they can learn about their users, their populations, um, they can learn about how they use their software, uh, they could, you know, how, which buttons are you clicking on, which are you not clicking on, all of this data that you get from detailed telemetry. That is the kind of data that Facebook Ireland was always very keen to send Facebook in the US for analysis and that companies around the world would want to be sending each other on this basis. Data that's not strictly required for providing a service, which regardless of the current uh, adequacy of the current transfer um, uh, modalities in GDPR, you could imagine that data strictly required 
for a service, you know, you might be able to move it around the world because how else are you going to email somebody, for example? Um, but this is data that's that's you know, nice to have for a business model. And this enables companies to have this nice to have data. So for example, Google uh, has, Google's privacy sandbox has possibly vaporware, a uh, several tools. One of them uses federated learning called Flock. It's not the only one. And the more that it's looked at, the more it does appear that Flock is probably one of the least likely to be deployed compared to the other tools in the sandbox, which do operate similarly. The idea of Flock is that instead of your web browsing history going to hundreds or thousands of ad tech firms, it stays in your browser and is analysed by your browser speaking to other browsers in the world to understand if there's a group of people who you are like and that you can then put that label on your head and say, I'm like these other people that we've analysed confidentially. We've ascertained that we... that me and a hundred other people in the world uh, fall into a box who can be targeted by advertisers. Um, and that is all done without sharing your web browsing history directly with Google. But of course, controlling Chrome and orchestrating that situation, uh, Google may still be a data controller there. They, personal data exists, even if you're the only one who can see it. So maybe a definitional challenge, but I think it's not particularly contentious. Um, and uh, we've seen case law, such as the case law around Jehovah's Witnesses from the CJU, that looks at orchestration ability of controllers. Say, so, well, you know, is an organization orchestrating this? But the data is not being transferred. There's not a clear data transfer happening here. So this is a move that makes data transfers less relevant for business models. Not fully irrelevant, because data is difficult to do all these all the things you want to do with data in these kinds of approaches, but a little bit less relevant for core business activities and for some of these really nice to haves. Now, I want to now zoom into another aspect of this, because if we think about the original driver for Schrems and Schrems Two in the Snowden leaks, we uh, we can see through um, FISA 702, the the authorizing uh, regime for um, for foreign intelligence, gathering of foreign intelligence from from uh, from providers of electronic uh, services in the U.S. electronic communication services. You uh, this regime doesn't just allow a uh, the U.S. government and the NSA to tap into data that is physically located in the United States. It does, as Casa Bowden uh, spoke about at the time, allow um, uh, orders to be made uh, against you know, platforms, operating systems, software providers to introduce methods uh, which you might have. You might then lose trust in your device. Your device might be betraying you due to orders that have been made against it by the NSA. We have in in the in the UK. There are both technical capability notices in the Investigatory Powers Act, as well as equipment interference warrants and in the regimes of the targeted and bulk equipment interference, um, you know, both of which have different characteristics you know, that, that are there, you know, such as the more procedural approach in technical capability notices where you are in dialogue with the provider. But what this really means is that if we're moving towards a world where sensitive things and business sensitive things happen on individual devices... And intelligence agencies want to still use people's devices in order to survey them. Then, countries that uh, have control over infrastructure uh, become uh, become the key. Not just company, countries that have control over the destination of transfers into cloud servers. If uh, you know, there's been showdowns in this area. You know, Apple versus FBI in the San Bernardino case was the most uh, kind of recent large one, but there's also been discussions in Australia and currently discussions in in um, the UK with Facebook. Facebook is actually not really much of a threat uh, in this in this world because Facebook controls very little in the way of of hardware. Um, we're thinking more about Apple and Google and Microsoft being uh, being some of the core um, uh, the core conduits for this for US companies. Uh, having uh, effectively bugs introduced into them to exfiltrate data, potentially, if you use equipment interference approaches, without the knowledge of the controller. So this creates a really interesting challenge because it moves us away from thinking about does the controller consciously move data from one place to another to where is the jurisdiction that might have an influence over infrastructure that is uh, that forms the layer below data processing around the world, 
Uh, what can that jurisdiction do? What is known about what it does? And can we trust iPhones or certain Android devices or similar? Also, you know, concerns about Huawei devices we've seen in recent years. Um, uh, can we trust uh, these devices when placed in in other countries' contexts? And what does this mean for data protection law? Well, if the um, uh, if the operating system provider is aware of this potential leak or facilitates it, then arguably they are a controller and arguably they are facilitating transfers to the NSA of raw data, for example, or indeed of data about populations that could even be calculated using edge computing. Um, uh, perhaps that's one approach that could actually bend it and constrain it into a transfer. But it also becomes challenging when we think about that, that transfers are are now, you know, that, that may be happening unbeknownst to these operating systems, or indeed, you know, they're shutting their eyes and don't want to examine uh, what's happening here. Can we really say they're a controller? Should they really have established a lawful basis to send that data to, to the United States, regardless of, of the purpose? Maybe they know, maybe they don't. It enters, in, enters us into a, a challenging area, um, and I think one that might, might appear in future as a flashpoint. Um, this is also heightened by the EDPB guidance on supplementary measures for um, standard contractual clauses, which focuses on encryption in such a manner that it can't be decrypted at the end point as a main technical supplementary measure in a situation like the US, where you have the ability for the public sector just to siphon data out of cloud services. So this this direction is uh, you know, is interesting because they think it's very protective, but actually you can do a lot with encrypted data. You can do a lot with encrypted systems. Uh, and that may be a, a flaw with the EDPB's approach and a flaw indeed with the framing of transfer rather than thinking about controllership and processing more broadly and the locus of control of, of that, whether it's a public or a private provider. So the um, I think the last thing I want to say is where we're going with this governance of operating systems then. Uh, if we need to think that the future flashpoints around surveillance might be more infrastructural rather than the moving of data physically from place to place in the as the explicit operation that we're trying to govern um, or limit, then we we get to looking at other areas of law. We're looking at the Digital Markets Act in the European Union right now, proposing directly, for, for the first time, the identification of operating systems as a thing to govern in a statute, um, particularly. Uh, and that's being governed through you know, opening up app stores, trying to introduce some interoperability, flavoured obligations, with other sensors on the device, and so on. Um, and, and we might, you know, this is an interesting question, we might end up in a situation of of uh, of countries wanting to run more of their own infrastructure, wanting to have a say, running their own versions of Android, maybe running even something else. But vertical integration is so tied up in this. You know, when you look at how Apple works, it's going really from software cloud services all the way down to hardware designed to work as a monolith. If you take out a block, the, com the company will fight you to the end in the courts, uh, no matter where they are, to try and stop you. Removing their app store as the only app store, removing their their hardware as the only, you know, allowing you to run other operating systems and the hardware. All of these things they will say will endanger security and data protection will be used as a weapon to prevent this vertical integration being removed. So, well, you can't remove our app store and say that we, you know, we um, uh, you have to let other apps on the device because those apps will just siphon the user data off, and that wouldn't be responsible under data protection and other laws. So all of this is is happening at once, um, and data protection then becomes both a sword and a shield, and maybe uh, a, a, a approach that's not fit for purpose if you're trying to govern surveillance using the mechanism of adequacy in the future. Um, and as it gets more complicated, if we do get court cases that are flashpoints around this, I think it's hard to say where the court will go with this if they'll double down or or try and take it out of the scope of of the law. Um, particularly if we're in a regime, in a, in a legal regime, when we are governing operating systems in other ways and not everything has to be squeezed into data protection law to achieve. Um, so cloud was a bat the, the cloud was the prison battleground um, and had a geographic location. So I think devices uh, and hardware and infrastructure are the next battleground. Thanks very much. Wow, that's perfect timing, Michael. Thank you so much. Um, I can't see any questions as yet. Uh, please do type in your questions in the Q&A or the chat. 
So um, before before we get any questions, I do have a question for you, Michael. So again, thanks for just going beyond uh, the data protection and adequacy, looking at this content layer or, or the applications or the platforms and thinking a bit more holistically, which is really helpful. So thinking about this whole um, network and the internet as, as structured as it is in, in various layers, I wonder, uh, so you, you refer to operating systems and devices, I wonder what the role of um, telcos or the electronic communications network and service providers uh, come in when we discuss this. And obviously, e-privacy uh, directive is a part of the telecoms package, essentially, and the e-privacy regulations. So I wonder, I wonder what your concerns and, and take on this um, is. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, Adina. Thanks. The you know, telcos have been desperate to try and vertically integrate because they've seen, you know, that you know, we've obviously seen before, obviously all the net neutrality debates around them trying to get closer into the application layer because that's where the money is um, and have largely failed to do so. And indeed, things like net neutrality do, do put limits on that. I think telcos end up in an even worse situation of moderating power here because, you know, the idea of edge computing is that data transfers, uh, well, there's two, actually, there's two elements here. One is that the uh, you know, telcos can see less, even less than before. You know, even when we had you know, tempora and people tapping the actual fiber optic cables, you know, the data didn't really make much sense unless you went into the cloud server because that's where it was all pieced together in relation to the operation of that, you know, of, of, of Google or whatever. And Google might have actually been encrypting it in relation to the server. So it might have been encrypted as a middle point. And um, you know, so all of this, and obviously HTTPS and these things make it hard for um for interception of by telcos to to have much of an effect but an interesting side effect with edge computing at least some types of edge computing is that edge computing um has a trade off and what you often have to, when you when you design um edge computing and and federated learning and so on that works you think about um the computational cost on device uh, like, is the device going to you know, use loads of energy and get really hot to try and do this complicated cryptographic thing? Or is it going to communicate a lot? And that creates delay and latency. You know, if I if I need to keep pass, if I need to pass you the data with you back and uh, throw like pass the parcel to get the answer um, hundreds or thousands of times, then that's a big communication you know, latency there. Edge computing does, if you, if you try and make devices very lightweight, maybe IoT and similar like that, uh, and sensors, in order to stop them using loads of battery and using loads of energy on compute, you often then have to use a lighter cryptographic system, which requires more communication the whole time. So telcos do have an important role, and I think that then comes into questions like 5G and so on. But it's quite a blunt one. You, know, you could try and stop it or start it and so on, which may be a battleground there um, as well. So I think that's that's um, the infrastructure there is... is as we get closer to the edge and computing, you know, you get on device. It's really the the ideal architecture of the network to begin with. The network becomes dumber and dumber, and the devices become smarter and smarter. That's um that's really happening to a degree probably greater than we probably imagined as the internet was being designed. That's great, thanks, Michael. There's one more question for you in the Q and A, uh, and Derek is asking uh, if you're suggesting the GDPR is already a redundant tool in stopping preventing the surveillance of. EU citizens' personal data when transfers to the US, for example? Um, no, I'm not really saying that right now. Um, uh, I think it's just, it, it's got an inherent tension around transfers. Uh, and we have to assume that we're, if we're thinking about surveillance, we're faced with an organisation with unlimited capacity and power to, to, to get what it wants. Um, and, and it will no doubt move to looking at edge computing and privacy preserving methods also because in surveillance terms it helps them meet proportionality tests in their own law looking at you know uh, if you if you can do target interference where you only look at the data of people who you think are suspects it actually does create new forms of you know, balancing of necessity and proportionality so pets are actually a nice tool for surveillance agencies too in making in potentially surveying more targets you know, without being accused of, of, of surveying everybody. So it's, um, uh, that doesn't always solve all the problems, but it's an interesting zone. I just want to go, Karen wrote a question quickly in, in the chat. In the yes, she's, yeah, she's, I was about she's to say. The chat. Um, yes. uh, the, it's, a, it's a really interesting question, Karen. I think it does focus on being ambitious in things like the Digital Markets Act, but equally, um, that comes with a danger. 
if we say that all countries should have you know, their own infrastructures, their own operating systems and so on, we need law to take a stronger role than ever to, assume, to, to stop misuse. If, uh, if um, big multinational companies do at least create friction and a lot of difficulty technically in, to, to, in, in having states facilitate abuse, on those on those systems, you know, they can't just click their fingers and slurp all the data. If if Apple stands in the way, there might be ways for them to do it, but they might have to hack, negotiate, bring Apple under their jurisdiction. And of course, you know, if we think about countries with strong human rights regimes, it might be okay. But if we start to say the world should have very fragmented infrastructure, then it does really ask the question of you know who's going to get hurt by this? Well, people in 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 uh, particularly in authoritarian regimes. Um, uh, you know, who might not then benefit from this higher level of protection? Basically, a trade-off to say the US can survey you, but in return, your own government can't, which is, you know, a trade-off that many would be willing to take in your own authoritarian situation. So, those are all really tricky questions. So, to gain the advantage, though, I mean, keep an eye on the CMA and the the Digital Markets Act, and think about how they tally together with surveillance, because that's not being done enough yet. That's great. Thanks a lot, Michael. If there are further questions, we can address them in the Q&A or the chat. So thanks again for your brilliant contribution and for taking us beyond uh, adequacy and uh, looking at further issues around infrastructure. So with that, uh, I will introduce our final speaker for today, uh, for the first part of the day, and that is Professor Dahi Makshihi from the Queen's University of Belfast. And he's a professor of law and innovation at the Queen, uh, Queen's University Belfast. His areas of expertise include law and technology, audiovisual vis media law, copyright, um, and the creative industries, the sharing economy, and open data. He was awarded the Eisenhower Fellowship in 2019, and he was for five years a member of the Irish government's Open Data Governance Board. He's a co-director in creative um, it, of the Creative Industries Research and Development Partnership Future Science Northern Ireland, funded by the AHRC, and was a co-investigator co at CREATE, the uh, Research Council's UK Centre for Copyright and New Business Models in the Creative Industries. He is the program convener for the Q uh, Queen's University Belfast LM in Law and Technology and teaches regulation, innovation, regulating digital communications and media and information law. He has published widely in various uh, reputable and world leading journals and edited um, various, uh, various monographs and uh, sorry, edited collections and published uh, monographs in, in, in the areas of his research. So I would like to ask Dahi to uh, start and introduce his talk that is uh, interestingly entitled "Never Mind the New Oil: Is There Mud on the Wheel? Uh, is There Mud on the Wheels? The Information Industries After Brexit." Dahi, please. Thank you very much, Idina, and thank you uh, to each of Karen, Henry, and Michael for such interesting uh, uh, talks. I'm going to just start things slightly, slightly differently. Um, in February of this year, the brilliant Northern Irish journalist Sam McBride broke a story um, in one of the uh, one of the Belfast-based newspapers, um, and he told a story about tractors and specifically tractors with mud on their wheels, and specifically tractors with mud on their wheels, which were being apparently denied entry uh, from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. And as the story uh, told, it, this had already led, for instance, to a digger being stopped from boarding a ferry. Um, rather cheekily then illustrated with a photograph of Boris Johnson um, driving a digger, digger through a wall to prove his point of getting Brexit done. And this is an evocative story for all sorts of ways. I mean, even just the relationship between soil and nationhood um, sort of generated a hundred opinion columns about what did this what did this really mean? And it comes down to um comes down really to a question of of biosecurity on one hand, but of the complexity of trade relations after Brexit um on the other. Um, and the the tale being told here was that this was another illustration of the new border in the Irish Sea as a result of the Northern Ireland Protocol, um, meaning that it would be difficult for sort of normal trade to continue within the United Kingdom because in this case of concern about soil. 
Now, as always in relation to uh, to questions of this nature, it's more complicated. Um, there have actually been uh, various versions of requirements to wash farm equipment before moving it from Great Britain to Northern Ireland for many years. Um, this seems in more recent years comes down to a concern around a particular pest called the eel worm, um, which potato growers uh, do really don't like. Um, but it seemed also that there you know, there was an intensification here. McBride referred to how um, people were now crawling underneath machinery with hand lamps and inspection lights. And this was built even fur built upon even further by concern about uh, soil for cricket grounds and potted plants and garden centres and so on. And indeed, in March, the UK government made an announcement um, that in certain circumstances, some of these apparent new requirements uh, would be would be waived. This is part of this power play around unilateral variations of the agreement. And specifically, traders can now remove can now move machinery between GB and NI without the need for certification, as long as excessive soil and plant debris is removed. So why are we talking about this story today? This is this is kind of another reality of. Um, of the Northern Ireland Protocol, or Schrodinger's stateless, as I'm beginning to think of it. Uh, but it's the, the the kind of the workings out of the decisions made by um, by the United Kingdom, it, not to go for kind of a single market customs union type approach, even in respect of avoiding the border on the island of Ireland, but instead for um, uh, focusing upon a relatively narrow trade and cooperation agreement um, and then special provisions in respect of uh, of Northern Ireland. If we look back at those years of negotiations, what do we see? We see a focus upon goods rather than on services. We see this in the trade and cooperation agreement itself. And of course, we see it in respect of Northern Ireland, where um, in this case, the soil, the, so the, the, the soil is covered by the... Um, uh, by the phytosanitary provisions and by agricultural safety and so on. Um, even within the services universe in the TCA, we see an emphasis, of, we see sort of more detail on financial services than we see in other areas. There have been lots of discussion even in the last couple of months around some of the gaps in relation to intellectual property, wider aspects of the creative industries, including touring musicians, um, very, very little in respect of broadcasting and audiovisual media services, which are broadly carved out of the TCA. And so the UK is now facing a position where it's trying to articulate um, its new data or IT industrial policy, uh, while the EU27 continue to do the same, and as we've seen in recent announcements right up to this week. But this matters for the themes of this new network, and indeed for the adequacy point that we're engaging with, uh, with today. I mean, as my colleagues have already said, um, you know, there's a deliberate decision made to take the specifics of adequacy out of the trade and cooperation agreement. Um, and of course, in the agreement itself, we see we see a chapter or a title on digital trade. I would describe it as aspirational. Uh, everyone's very proud of how you know it's got more on digital trade than trade agreements normally have, which is not itself saying all that much. And of course, audiovisual services are out, and the IP provisions um, can be can be further discussed in in many ways. So with with this idea of you know, how we do draw the line between goods and services and where we erect borders in mind. I'm just going to make three points today. One is about UK strategy and Oliver Dowden's recent comments in particular. The second is about international relations. And the third uh, is just responding to what some of my fellow speakers have said on the upcoming adequacy decision itself. And I'll come back and say something very brief about Northern Ireland again at the end. So first point, um, the... The UK is now starting to articulate a data, information, AI, etc. strategy, but it's going about it in in a funny enough way. Um, Henry has already mentioned some of the Secretary of State's uh, comments here around uh, around data protection, and of course, this is you know it's presented in a reasonably cautious fashion thus far. So uh, so Dowden referred in his his February column in the Financial Times to a long and proud, proud tradition of defending privacy and maintaining world-class data protection standards, uh, but not copying and pasting GDPR, as Henry had on his slide earlier on. And he identifies a couple of points, um, again, which others have touched upon. He Dowden summarizes the two issues as people don't, think, don't do things because they're afraid of breaking the law, and people don't do things because they don't understand the law. And that's kind of his... Um, 
his assumption here. Now, I think if we dig down further into what Secretary of State is saying, there's a couple of interesting points here. One is that question of um, the information commissioner. And of course, Dowden was writing in the context of announcing the search for the new commissioner. Um, and the link that's being drawn between the appointment of a new commissioner and perhaps a resetting of social and economic goals um, is quite interesting. As the Open Rights Group has pointed out, Parliament has on a number of occasions already called into question the way in which the ICO's independence operates. Um, and so we, uh, we see here an issue that will no doubt be attended to, as we've seen already, inadequacy, but will be a broader issue as to the relationship between Parliament, government, and the uh, and the Commissioner, particularly if there is more of a sense of the government's view on what should be happening. Um, and the second point I think I draw from Dowden's uh, article, which I haven't really touched on as much so far, um, is how he frames this in relation to COVID. Now, again, not hugely surprising, um, but the Secretary of State is arguing, you know, for years we've seen data through the lens of risk. And now, after COVID, we know how much we've got to lose when we don't use it. Data is the great opportunity of the time, et cetera, et cetera. And this seems like the kind of the long over the, the long kind of promised re-reckoning of the care data issue, sort of a decade on, where now the relationship between sort of health, public well-being, and data is being put out in a in a new way. Now, again, we can we can discuss whether that's the the right framing or not, but a framing it is, and I think that's kind of the core point I'm trying to, to make here. The UK now is sort of articulating its national data strategy, um, and that itself is interesting. And I think the, you know, we're seeing even in aspects of the EDPB's response to the adequacy uh, proposal, this idea of, you know, how aligned the two sides are going to be in terms of their strategy and policy. So the national data strategy says, we want the UK to be a nation of digital entrepreneurs, innovators, and investors, the best place in the world to start and grow a new business, as well as the safest place in the world to go online. Now, I'm not sure if they intended it this way, but this makes me think of the kind of the classic project management triangle. You know, uh, you, you know, you've got three, you've got good, fast, and cheap, and you have to pick two. Um, the the kind of the tensions between those three are probably going to be the overriding issue of information industry policy in the UK, certainly as it's any kind of reset or rearticulation of data protection uh, proceeds, if it does. And, and in some ways, this is a good thing. Um, I mean, there have been moments in sort of modern political history where the sense of a national information or data strategy has been there. I have particular interest in the IT advisory panel of the mid, early to mid-1980s. We could think of some of the work in Gordon Brown's government around digital Britain and uh, the way in which uh, a number of different policy and indeed cross-departmental issues were brought together under seemingly one umbrella. What have we got from here? We've got the DCMS 10 tech priorities um, uh, announced in March, which would, as we're told, power a golden age of tech in the UK. And um, Perry Keller made a very interesting point earlier on about how kind of AI um, points might overtake aspects of GDPR. I think certainly in policy terms, kind of an AI agenda may overtake a data protection agenda. Um, now, again, I would like to see more of this. I mean, I don't think it belongs only to one department. And the DCMS published its priorities on um, the popular and very shiny website shorthand, but not in Parliament, not on its own website and so on. And one would hope that if there is to be tech priorities and indeed national strategy, some of these will be joined up a wee bit more. Secondly, the UK is starting to identify the international relations dimension um, in data protection and in related areas much more explicitly. I was struck by a number of points here. Um, first, the Foreign Affairs Committee of the House of Commons has launched its kind of its tech inquiry, which I know a number of people on the call will be submitting evidence to or interested in. Um, and of course, it draws out a number of particular uh, points. How can the Foreign Office engage with private technology companies to influence and promote the responsible development and use of data and new technologies? And both the Foreign Affairs Committee and indeed the Secretary of State have highlighted the UK's current presidency of the G7 as a key lever here. Um, and this is important. I mean, the G7 kind of has come in and out of tech policy over the years. I mean, in the mid to late 1990s, the G7 was maybe a significant voice at sea, some of that ground to the OECD and others in terms of sort of soft law instruments. Um, but certainly that idea of kind of a G7 view on information in industries is something that's been, has been spotted by the UK as an important forum for, for some of this thinking. Um, Secretary of State says that uh, the UK will develop data partnerships with some of the world's fastest growing economies and the national data strategy itself talks about agreeing ambitious data provisions in trade negotiations and using a newly independent seat in the WTO to influence trade rules for data for the better. 
Good luck with that. Um, I mean, the, the kind of the difficulty of dealing with international agreements in the sector is well known, whether it be kind of uh, uh, trips in relation to IP, cultural exceptions in relation to goods and services, even the, the huge carve out of audiovisual from the, the trade and cooperation agreement. Um, and of course, you know, as the UK does sort of more self-contained policy projects, like the online harms white paper, um, there's a sense of a sort of domestic consumption and extraterritorial reach, but also then trying to extra um, uh, influence on others, companies and governments. And Michael mentioned here very kindly the work that I've done around responsibility and that kind of responsibilization agenda. Uh, the degree to which that informs the UK's diplomatic strategy with states and indeed with companies, if we can start to think about it that way, um, is interesting. Meanwhile, as Karen rightly pointed out earlier this morning, you know the ICO itself. Um, may find itself in a different position when it comes to its influence upon um, uh, other institutions and other states. So again, it is good that the Foreign Affairs, Com Foreign Affairs Committee is doing its investigation around tech, and I think it's, it's certainly quite timely because if the UK is developing an, a foreign policy in relation to, uh, to data, there's much more work that needs to be done. Coming back full circle then to, to sort of today's topic of the uh, of of adequacy again, I mean much of this to me and you know, sort of uh, not being the the expert that others are, and it comes down to the way in which a forum for debate is created and issues are framed. So again, I mentioned earlier on the Open Rights Group, and I think we have participation from that side of of the world uh, later on uh, in the afternoon. Um, in its kind of commentary on adequacy, identify sort of three big issues, uh, bulk surveillance, et cetera, um, institutional issues around the ICO and the, the infamous immigration provisions in the UK's implementation of, of GDPR. And these are good points, and some of them are reflected in the EDP, EDPB's uh, uh, a recent publication, but of course, this is a way in which long-standing issues around data are now debated. It's a different audience for um, for 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 a critique, and indeed, as um, uh, in the text exchange between Jahong and uh, Karen earlier on, of course, the idea that it's the Commission who is dealing with the adequacy decision, and therefore that's what's open to challenge in the Court of Justice, and again, different fronts on which things can be handled because of the route of putting adequacy in a standalone rather than in DCA, which can be perfectly understandable why you go about why you go about doing that. And there's, you know, in the EDPB's opinion, there's a lot of warning shots there, and I think that's, again, part of how data is likely to be, to be debated in the coming years. And highlight here also something that one of our, one of the, the network's co-conveners, Roisin Costello, made in her comments to the Irish broadcaster RTE, where she highlights the fact that, of course, Pulling in both directions can happen. So as the EU articulates new standards and or the UK might, as Dowden has suggested, investigate uh, uh, different directions, that itself can mean that what's happening at the moment in terms of adequacy is clearly not the, the final decision. And Karen, again, earlier on, talked about the Brussels effect and we've got a couple of different ideas. There's Brussels effect and a, a kind of let's be free London effect and how they're reconciled is tricky. The, 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 the other thing there, of course, and I think Johnny Ryan is from the Irish Council of Civil Liberties is joining later in the afternoon. Um, Johnny has made a really interesting uh, point in, in public debate in the Republic of Ireland in the last couple of weeks around how the, sort of, the sands are shifting in the United States uh, and he highlights kind of legislation or draft legislation at a very early stage in the US, which takes perhaps more of an adequacy mindset in terms of data transfer from the US to, to, to third countries. And again, um, the ICCL and Johnny in particular has framed this in terms of Ireland and its um, regulatory schemes. But that idea, of course, I mean, why does the UK have a trade and cooperation agreement? and not go down the single market customs union route, well, at least in part, in order to create the negotiating space for a trade agreement with the United States. But if the United States is changing its attitude in terms of the relationship between trade and data, then, you know, again, careful what you wish for. So speaking of being careful what you wish for, I'm going to bring it to a close. Um, it's quite nice in some ways that um, the, uh, the space for uh, agreement regarding adequacy uh, was framed as a bridge because here in Northern Ireland, of course, we're very excited about the idea of, um, as the Prime Minister has promised, a bridge between Scotland and Northern Ireland, uh, whether it ever gets built, whether it turns out to be a tunnel or a roundabout under the Isle of Man, or whether they manage to avoid the munitions dump that's somewhere up in the channel. Again, only time will tell. In Northern Ireland, though, of course, we also see this because there are no provisions in relation to, to data in the protocol uh, itself in terms of, you know, sort of substantive rules. So the, the, the border might be in the Irish Sea in relation to goods or indeed mud, um, but the border is on the, on the island of Ireland in relation to, uh, to data. And again, all things going well in terms of adequacy and so on, that might not be as, 
as much of an issue. Now, probably this was always going to happen. A data border in the Irish Sea would have brought its own, its own challenges. It's bad enough that I can't order anything at the moment from John Lewis, um, but actually applying perhaps uh, some of the complexity there uh, of treating Northern Ireland as part of the European Union for data protection purposes would have been, again, politically interesting. Um, uh, our, our good friend Ian Brown has pointed out how um, you know, if you're in if you're in Northern Ireland um, and operating on an all island basis in relation to goods in particular, then you're still covered by um, by UK's data protection law because of that. But then you will also be affected by the EU's provisions um, in terms of customers in the Republic and and so on. And this is something I think that businesses in Northern Ireland are only continuing to come to the terms with. Same's happening actually on the other side of the border. I mean, Enterprise Ireland have tried kind of a bit of a shock and awe argument here of telling Irish companies, you know, if you transfer data to the UK, including Northern Ireland. This would be the same as if you're transferring it to India or Brazil. Now, this provokes all sorts of different directions, varying all the way from, oh, my God, that's awful. Why didn't you tell me that sooner? To, oh, OK, well, are we not supposed to be transferring it to India? But again, that kind of adjustment to uh, a particular to, to the peculiarities of Northern Ireland being in and out of the um, European Union, there's a bit of a window into the types of challenges that the UK is going to, to, to face here, particularly as it does try to articulate what it means to have a national data strategy, a national AI policy, a new independent foreign policy in this regard. Um, so we, you know, we used to talk about, uh, or, or at least make fun of data as the new oil. It was a little here, maybe a little bit closer to the new soil, particularly in terms of relationship between data protection and other aspects of the information industries. Could push this point further and talk about, talk about silkworms and eelworms and so on. Um, but I think I'll just draw to a close at this stage and say that, of, as, as kind of my agreement with all others have said so far today, um, which is that you know the adequacy agreement is really important. Um, but it's the debate that's around it and indeed the kind of sort of repositioning of the UK on various fronts um, that that is going to affect its relationship with the Republic of Ireland um, as well as uh, the various types of super duper trade deals that are on the way. Thank you all very much for indulging me this morning. No more tractors and I look forward to the rest of the day. That's excellent. Thanks a lot, Dahi, for, for saving some time for questions and the, the final discussion. So again, you really brought together all the uh, previous talks uh, well in your sort of um, a, a more a wider and broader overview of, of these issues, plus announcing some, some uh, talks in, in, and discussions in, in panel two. So uh, that was really fascinating. And I certainly have questions, but I would like to see if um, someone uh, from, from the floor, a participant, audience, other panelists? If not, then I can start perhaps. So, Michael? Oh yeah, I have a, I have a question, I mean, to Dahi, I think also more broadly. Do, okay. do we end up in a situation where we might get a kind of double jeopardy approach for, you know, say people in Northern Ireland, if you're a part of a data breach, you know, you're actually falling in different regulators who haven't got good cooperation agreements clearly in law between each other. And the same, I guess, broadly with the UK and EU. You know, does this, with some clear cut areas like that, it's kind of the opposite of forum shopping. And I just, I just think that that's, um, you know, we've lost the one stop shop. And can public international law help us, or are we sort of stuck? So I think Karen has her hand up and is probably going to say something more uh, more profound than I will on this. Michael, I think my only response on that is I, I think we're about to see a really interesting case study in the development of kind of aspects of economic and sort of trade integration at different levels. So if we think on one hand, and we're starting to see this in the kind of good supply chain in Northern Ireland, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the identification of an oil island economy in certain respects, including in terms of you know how um, how how supply chains operate, but also how companies are 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 organised. But of course, that's happening with what will be potentially a uh, a data protection border within what should be more of a unified approach in relation to goods and agriculture and so on. I think that and that offers quite difficult questions for for operators here. And I think it offers kind of, again, maybe an advance warning to the UK as it tries to deal with data within the framework of trade agreements. I and mean, it's never going to be possible to have perfect alignment of all of your customs policy, all of your goods policy, all of your agriculture policy, all of your data policy, all being the same, because you want to enter into different agreements in different ways, depending on how much negotiating headroom you have. But that's that's kind of my my warning on it is having, you know, an integrated economy in some respects, but not in others, um, poses new types of challenges, including in relation to even this corporate organization. But Karen will have a better answer. I was just going to echo what Dahi was uh, is saying there, that it does pose challenges. 
Um, and it's particularly interesting for Northern Ireland because we have in the last 20 years or so tried to diversify our economy. Um, and one of the things that we've tried to do is bring in foreign direct investment in the form of financial services, creative services, which the has been part of. Um, so we've been quite successful in uh, attracting, say, software developers, um, fintechs, uh, banking services and, and financial services into Northern Ireland. And that was brilliant when Northern Ireland could act as the EU base. Um, but now those same companies are having to consider, do they actually want to rely on an advocacy decision? Do they want to rely on binding corporate rules? Um, and what are they going to do about having representatives in both jurisdictions and potentially facing um, legal challenges in both jurisdictions? And there has been some discussion that maybe they may want to have their headquarters in Dublin. Um, and so that's that's tough for, for someone like me from Northern Ireland wanting to see my home economy grow. Uh, much as I am happy for business to move to the south, it does present real challenges for the Northern Ireland economy and how to grow it if we get stuck between two jurisdictions and two sets of laws. And just to add very briefly to that, I mean, one of the most interesting dimensions of the Northern Ireland Protocol was the extent to which, for instance, inward investment efforts in Northern Ireland are able to position Northern Ireland as, you know, the uh, the gateway to multiple markets, the bridge, the the new opportunity. I mean, versions kind of of Northern Ireland as, I don't know, Singapore, Hong Kong, Freeport, whatever different story you want to tell on that. Um, but of course, the eventual result of the Protocol and Trade and Cooperation Agreement is that that works well in some respects, often on the kind kind of manufacturing or agri-food side, but it may not work as well um, in others. And so the kind of that fear of, you know, flight of, of, of headquarters to Dublin or Amsterdam, you know, there was a stage when that was being talked about quite seriously as maybe it would be Belfast rather than Dublin. Um, and as Karen says, you know, maybe some of the, some of the air has gone out of that, of that balloon. Now, again, we can see, for instance, you know, even in kind of legal services and so on, lots of cross-border operations. So you can have your UK representative and your uh, EU representative, but still having them connected by a sometimes quite slow train. Uh, so you can see, again, kind of realignment within, within sectors here. But this is exactly the challenge for Northern Ireland as a sort of investment dependent and, a, as Karen says, an attempt to diversify economy. If it's the case that Northern Ireland is the best of both worlds in relation to food, but not in relation to certain information industries, then that's a, that's a different political issue for sure. Um, sorry, did I freeze? Oh. We've got you. Oh, okay. I thought I froze or, so, or something froze. Um, I can't see any other questions, but I do have a question I'm not sure it can be answered in a short time, but you can try that. <laughs> so I wonder, um, I would like to unpick this Brussels effect paradigm a little bit uh, versus the laissez-faire approach that you mentioned that in, the, in the UK, potential uh, more in the future. So uh, as, as Karen said, uh, that there's within the tech industry, allegedly, there is no desire to diverge from GDPR because of because of the the Brussels effect. But I wonder, I wonder whether that's entirely um, whether we can presume that completely given given already evidence of some forum shopping from Google, etc. So I wonder how how you see companies, uh, big big tech companies, positioning themselves between these two uh, effects or approaches. I mean, it's a great question, and I'm sure others will have more insight on it. I mean, I, I think so far the UK is focusing, ironically, on positioning rather than on actual legislative change. I mean, I think that's the signals that industry is supposed to be taking from the national data strategy, from Oliver Dowden's various comments, from indeed the process for appointing a new, inf a new commissioner. Um, the idea is to say, you know, the UK is open for business. Things are going to be different now. Now, um, the headroom for doing that is actually, as others have said, very limited. And um, it might not work, particularly if the US position starts to kind of nuance or develop here, um, or indeed there's kind of the types of legal challenges that others, others have mentioned. So I think the kind of the, the strategy at the moment is to say, look, you know, now we can do things. Um, let's think about what we can do. But we also see this, for instance, in relation to the online harms discourse, the kind of vexed question of Article 15 of the e-commerce directive and other measures, but saying, well, you know, there is now kind of a bit of an overton window to talk about a different regulatory approach. Now, again, like others, I don't see that happening today nor tomorrow. I think much of this is about kind of a, an attempt to send signals 
particularly to those that would have been critical of the European Union. But of course, again, you know, if you say, well, the UK is going to do things differently, but then you're going to have to follow whatever the UK's peculiarities are, whether that be aspects of unharm, online harms or obscenity or terrorism or whatever. And you may face market access issues in EU 27 because the TCA's digital provisions, you know, have market access, but they're untested provisions and they're relatively weak in terms of kind of guaranteeing the right of a UK based international company to have unfettered access into the European market, particularly when it comes to any possible divergence around data issues. So I don't see immediate change here. I think a lot of this is just trying to set kind of a, a to, 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 to send signals to enterprise that the UK is the place to be. Whether that works will be time, will only, again, as I've said, only time will. Okay, thanks, Zaki. There's one more question, I think, for all the panelists, so um, uh, if someone would like to volunteer to answer, and there's a question from Carolyn Q&A. Uh, so she says it strikes her how development of the general approach appears to be slowly, de slowly devoid of the human approach or allows for any cultural nuance. Uh, so she wonders if the panelists could com comment on this. Would anyone like to? Karen, please, yes. Um, Carolyn, I'll, I'll try and give you an answer. <laughs> Uh, because what we see happening with the, the data adequacy assessment um, is that um, the Commission is trying to wear two hats. So the Commission is trying to ensure that there is an adequacy decision in place to facilitate data transfers. Um, so it very much is concerned with economic considerations. Um, and those economic considerations can at times trump or override um, the human considerations, the human rights considerations in particular. Um, and that then is what leaves the adequacy decision vulnerable to um, challenge being brought by a complainant such as Max Schrems. Um, and then the um, Court of Justice acting as the guardian for human rights at a later stage. Um, so there is this uh, eternal tension within the Commission. And part of the, the tension arises because you have 27 member states with slightly different interpretations as to what they value in terms of human rights, in terms of cultural attitudes, and in terms of what should be prioritized. Um, and so even uh, I was at a, a, a discussion earlier this week where someone from the Commission was explaining that they wanted um, member states to come forward with evidence as to why they need data retention powers, because the the Member states claim that they need these powers, but they never provide the evidence. And then that leaves the commission um, in, a, in a difficult position in terms of how to weigh up some member states wanting strong data retention powers and others wanting uh, strong limits on those powers. So the, I think the, the European Union very much reflects different cultural um, and human rights perspectives within it. Um, and that means that you have ongoing and inherent tension. Excellent. Wonderful. Many thanks uh, once more. So I think this brings us to a close of this session and we will continue at 1 p.m. in this same room, same link. It will stay live. So thanks again to all the speakers for your fascinating uh, talks and for your contributions. Thanks to the audience for their questions. I really hope I really hope that we'll continue this discussion in panel two, where we will bring in some additional perspectives from policymakers, regulators, the civil society, as well as the uh, legal practitioners. So I invite you to join us in an hour. Uh, so you can stay or rejoin at one using the same Zoom link as you wish. And please note, of course, I'm sure you will, you were notified that this uh, um, discussion was um, was recorded. So uh, the the recording should be available on the on the centers and the schools uh, YouTube uh, YouTube channel. Uh, sometime next week, so there will be an opportunity to rewatch uh, rewatch the session. So we will go on to our lunch break now, and um, I look forward to seeing to seeing you in uh, in an hour, where Nora will take over and host uh, and chair our second panel. Thank you. To welcome everybody, and to thank you for taking the time to join us this afternoon. My name is Norini Lidjan, and I'm Director of the Information Law and Policy Centre, one of the academic centres based at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies within the University of London, and a very proud partner of the Cross-Border Data Protection Network Project.
It's my very great pleasure to be chairing the second panel of today's event on data adequacy and commercial data transfers before the EU and UK. Before I introduce our excellent panel for this afternoon, I'd like to take this chance to draw your attention to the project's next event in this important series. It's taking place on the 23rd of June, and it will focus on data protection concerns in cross-border research and practice. Now, I'm delighted to be chairing the following panel this afternoon. In this panel, we will further explore and discuss the rich and insightful and also often provocative themes and insights that were addressed by this morning's academic panel. In terms of the format for this panel, we're looking for something a bit more discursive in order to unpack all of these key points that were addressed and discussed earlier today. I will introduce each of our panelists individually and they will briefly highlight between two to five minutes what they consider to be the key questions and challenges raised by today's topic. They can also respond to some of the issues that were raised this morning. That would also be very welcome. So to begin, our first panelist this afternoon is Boana Bellamy. She's president of Hunt and Andrews Kurth LLP Center for Information Policy Leadership, CIPL, a preeminent global information policy think tank located in Washington, DC, London, and Brussels, with more than 20 years of experience and deep knowledge of global data privacy and cybersecurity law, compliance and policy. She has a proven industry record in designing strategy and building and managing data privacy compliance programs. Lana was one of 20 privacy experts to participate in the transatlantic privacy bridge project between 2014 and 2015 that sought to develop practical solutions to bridge the gap between European and US privacy regimes. No easy feat. Barana was also the recipient of the 2019 International, International Associate, Association of Privacy Professionals, the, I, I, the IAPP, excuse me, Vanguard Award, which recognizes privacy professionals for outstanding leadership knowledge and creativity in the field of privacy and data protection. For one, whenever you're ready, we would really love to hear an overview of your thoughts of the key issues regarding this topic or any responses or takeaways you'd like to comment on from this morning's panel. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. So Nora, thank you very much for, for the introduction and thanks um, for, for the invitation to be here with you and delighted to see lots of friends on, on this panel as well. And I did listen to most of the this morning con conversation and thought it was really interesting. But I want to start, um, so the day discussion is all about uh, data flows. And I think we heard some really provocative uh, points of view this morning. And, and and I think I, I don't want to be too provocative, but but kind of my first point to my first point to raise would be, I kind of have a feeling that we are at the moment where it's time to rethink data flow provisions really in in the world. Um, I, I just don't know that um, the way we are going is actually in the right direction. It, it it's making the whole topic very legalistic, very complex. And while it's great for lawyers and it's really interesting even for a PhD student or maybe really interesting to see how these things all fit together, in practice, um, it, it becomes really, really complicated. Um, and and the, the, re, the sheer volume of data flows and the, the sheer reality of what the world looks like out there really would make it be so that all privacy officers and, and company lawyers would be spending all their days working with data flows. You know, when I joined, um, when I started my first job in privacy about 26 years ago, so that bio needs to be updated, by the way, it really is out of date. But um, uh, one of my first pieces of work was data flows. Um, and this is 26 years ago, right? And 26 years later, we are still talking about this and we haven't quite solved this. And if anything, I have seen since Schrems, but also since very big calls for data localization, the calls around data sovereignty. And Michael talked about sort of, you know, the importance of countries uh, uh, controlling the infrastructure and so on. I feel that 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 data flows are at a parallel at the moment. And um, that's not, I think, where the world needs to be um, for all the reasons of economic growth, um, ability to actually get benefits from data-driven economy and innovation at governmental level. I'm not talking about companies. I'm talking about governments and societies. We really need to ensure we have got as much as possible free and trusted and responsible data flows. Um, and, and I, you know, really hugely supported G20 
uh, work that was done in, in, in Japan in 2019 on free data flows with trust. And I really hope UK has a chance um, with G7 to kind of think about what do we as a world need as a new deal for data, a new deal for data flows? Because I really think the time has come to do that. Um, and the, why, why I think there is this perfect storm is, of course, because of Schrems and complication that that has uh, brought, because of Brexit and the complexity that has also brought to all of us, but also ability, I, I feel, for UK to explore and exploit as much as possible the boundaries uh, and, and the foundations that GDPR gives the UK uh, on data flows as well. So, so the question is, and, and, and I want to sort of maybe, maybe, maybe I agree actually with Karen this morning. She kind of said, you know, there's lots of bravado in the UK around data flows and so on, but or generally a data protection regime. But I actually think um, it is it is possible that there is a, a fine line between staying within the GDPR EU family of um, data protection and um, uh, uh, and and sort of the other. Uh, the other aspect would be leaving kind of that that foundation and doing something completely different. Well, I think there is a fine line and some middle between, in between that enables UK to use the marginal maneuver that exists in GDPR, the risk-based approach that Henry talked about. I asked the question. I really think it is in there. We have not exploited that whatsoever. And um, I'll come to the data flow point of risk-based approach as well. Um, so, um, and of course, certifications as well, they're very relevant for data flows. We haven't exploited that whatsoever. So I do think that, again, UK being out of EU is not great for anybody who loves EU, right? And, and believes in kind of pan-European uh, ideas. But in some way, maybe the country will be more agile, will not be bound by the... By the um, uh, ways we have done it always this way. It has to be done this way. So, and and I want to remind everybody. Eduardo will remember this. When we were when BCRs were formed in the first place, they didn't exist in the directive. Right? There was a group of really visionary companies. I was one of those at that time at Accenture that kind of said there is something that we can build out of this possibility for a company to adduce adequate safeguards and ensure adequacy and, and uniformity for its own data flows, right? And that's how BCI was born. And I really was hoping that with GDPR, we are going to see additional possibilities of BCR companies being able to share data with BCR companies, right? There is that language there which talks about um, entities that are uh, engaged in uh, joint economic activities can use binding corporate rules. But this isn't just about one group of companies, intra-group transfers. It would also be potentially working between one binding corporate rules company and another binding corporate rules. Both of them have got some form of approval by DPA, not some form. They've got the approval of DPA. So why not be able to share data between themselves when they are both seen to be adequate? This is uh, obviously in, in, in kind of adequate, not in the in the technical legal sense. So that idea needs to be explored, exploited it explored more. I know it was something that was discussed in the context of the uh, GDPR um, uh, uh, early drafts, and I know Commission had that in mind. But you know, Commission has been now sidetracked by such is complex issues that that, that 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 leadership isn't kind of there anymore. I hope it might be in the board, the European Data Protection Board, and I'd like to see that because when we were when we were cooking BCRs, we we had the support of some of visionary data protection authorities, some of the visionary EU commissioners, uh, EU well, commissioners and the officials. So I want us to go back to that mode of creativity, innovation in the way we regulate as opposed to defensive uh, and kind of uh, antagonistic um, way of thinking about things. So, um, so that's kind of one point that is, is uh, I suppose, a couple of points there. But, but now coming back to risk-based approach um, of GDPR, um, I actually think that in post shrems um, uh, world, uh, this is the only way this is the only way that companies can actually ever transfer data abroad, right? In in the in in, in, in using standard contractual clauses, um, uh, adducing additional safeguards, taking a risk-based approach in response of certain uh, in response to what their data flows really look like. It has to be if it, if the board goes 
um, if the board doesn't allow for that, I think we're going to come to a situation where where data flows will have to stop. And I can't imagine that that's the case because some of these data flows are inherent. So the question then becomes, what else can we use in GDPR that enables for that? Uh, we, in our response to, to Schrem's decision and um, uh, gave a number of um, what we saw were first reactions from global companies uh, and, and uh, you know, where the solutions could be. And we did talk about derogations. I, I know there is a big discussion out there whether derogations are narrowly interpreted or not, but I think we have to be there in the law for reason. So, you know, if indeed a risk assessment shows you can't take data abroad, but for some reason this data has to go abroad because it's absolutely necessary for me to, to communicate. Um, I, I, you know, a number of speakers talked about the reality of what the world looks like out there, right? If, if, if the point is to communicate to somebody in the U.S., well, the data has to go to the U.S. So, you know, no point. We can, we can have edicts and laws or whatever, but we can't stop that because that's the whole point point of a service, right? Or user wish. So then we have to look for derogations. Then we have to look for something else in GDPR as well uh, uh, and use these derogations wherever possible. Now, when it comes to adequacy, I my final point, I honestly, if I could rewind everything, I wish we never had adequacy as, as, as a legal concept. I think it's it's difficult. I think it's complex. It is very political. It takes very long to do the adequacy. I wished we had something like adequacy and accountability of the recipient and of the actual transfer, like Canada does. Interesting, Canada is now revising its law. And again, they're not copying GDPR style restrictions of data flows. They're just saying you have to be accountable for data flows, no matter whether the data flows are happening or transfers are happening within Canada or outside Canada, the, 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 the controller or the, the exporter remains accountable and can use obviously contractual, all kinds of other measures, uh, whatever they can to ensure that adequacy as well, but not adequacy, but accountability. And I kind of think that should be really maybe the way we, we, we are moving, but we are, where we, we are where we are. We have what we have. So the question is, how do we exploit what we have? Um, I think certifications could be an interesting point, and I hope UK is going to look into that. How can a GDPR-style certification bridge with perhaps some other foreign certifications, maybe ISO certifications, maybe cross-border privacy rules, if they were to be upgraded? I would like to see that sort of thinking coming out of, of frankly, Europe as well, and, and UK as well. Um, and then when it comes to adequacy decisions, I can only hope that UK is going to be more agile, quicker in... in um, finding countries adequate uh, than perhaps Europe is, because I, I don't, I, I, you know, I just think the process is far too long, far too complex to actually yield and perhaps doesn't even have legal certainty um, that we really all need in this world of completely connected technology, co connected people and connected companies. So I'm going to stop there and I'll take the rest into the, into the questions. Buana, thank you very much. Uh, you've raised a number of very significant points that touch on a lot of the arguments made this morning. I think in particular, you raise a really interesting argument around what type of model should states be looking for in terms of data transfers generally. And I know that you were very much in agreement with this morning's speaker, Henry Pierce, in terms of a shift towards the more risk-based assessment model. And of course, as you rightly pointed out, there are a number of provisions within the GDPR that already recognizes the relevance and appropriate use of that particular model. So, I mean, you have data impact assessments, yeah. for instance, you have the, the use of that term, the, the risk, what poses a high risk in terms of particular data processing activities. I think then what we then have a challenge with in terms of thinking about this from a purely legal perspective is that this is a hugely complex area because we've got two different legal models under which EU data protection law operates. We have this risk-based approach assessment model, but then we also have the fundamental rights model. And Unfortunately, in terms of providing for legal certainty and consistency, you had the GDPR model that combined the fundamental rights approach and the risk assessment approach, but you then have had a major series of landmark judgments by a key EU institution, the Court of Justice of the European, of the European Union, who have very much pursued the matter of data 
adequacy from a fundamental rights approach. And I don't think, well, and I stand to be corrected, but I don't think any other panelists would dispute the significant challenge that the European Commission now has to manage between balancing the, the different competing rules and safeguards that fall under both of those models. And I think also Boana raised a very significant point about exploring more the alternatives to data adequacy, because what we have now is not the data adequacy that is provided for under GDPR. We have a very different, heavily revised, even more complex system that we're all still waiting for clarity on from the European Commission and other key institutions. And this is a, a group of highly informed experts in this area. We are not managers running SMEs. We do not work at a data compliance department for a particular business. So from their perspective, the focus on there being greater certainty in this space is just so important for businesses. And that is important for businesses, not only in terms of enhancing innovation, but also to ensure that people's fundamental rights are being protected. You need clarity on both fronts. So I think that brings us very nicely to our second panelist for this afternoon, who I'm delighted to introduce, Heather Burns. She is policy manager at the Open Rights Group, the UK's largest grassroots digital rights organization. She leads Open Rights Group's political engagement portfolio on freedom of expression, surveillance and encryption. Quite a significant portfolio, Heather. She also monitors post-Brexit data protection issues in the international context, including their implications for devolution and the Irish border. Based in Glasgow, Heather looks forward to resuming the 23-minute flight to Belfast crack soon. I would like to join you in that ambition, Heather, Belfast <laughs> wonderful city. I wonder if you would be happy to perhaps explore some of the points that Boana mentioned in terms of the precarious position that data adequacy is now in from a UK perspective within the EU legal framework context. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. And, and I certainly understand that, uh, I think, as a Glaswegian more than some others. Uh, I do want to apologize for missing the morning session. My day has been hijacked by breaking news, which unfortunately I'll need to return to after this panel. So I'm missing some of the context of the opening sessions, but I'm sure you, you can all fill me in in context as the questions require. Um, so as a policy manager at a, at a, manager at a digital rights organization, um, we are very pro-adequacy. We would love adequacy to happen. But we would be remiss if we overlooked the, the issues that we, as digital and human rights advocates, are dealing with, which could interfere with that adequacy process. And if those things are ignored in, in the, the interests of politics or innovation, it's not contracts that are going to suffer, it's human beings. So we're very closely monitoring what I would group into to four loose groupings of digital rights issues, digital rights, human issues, rights issues, which could impact um, adequacy, commercial data transfers, and a lot worse. The big one, of course, is the immigration exemption, which is the UK's uh, very unique carve out from GDPR that while all pigs are equal, some pigs are more equal than others, and some pigs are less equal. And um, people who have a different immigration status um, have lesser rights under the UK's interpretation of GDPR. And we cannot look at this in, in a policy vacuum because we have, we've obviously left the European Union and we have what I call othered. We have othered 3 million people who were living here in their own homes into a different legal category. And when we have a, a home office, which is very much uh, focused on creating a hostile environment for anyone that they don't necessarily like, what they have is the the pattern and the model for uh, othering other people using that same pattern that the immigration exemption uh, created. Now, we as Open Rights Group are involved in legal action about that, which is still pending. But any uh, any regulator, any adequacy process is going to have to look us square in the eye and say, you know, if, if you are adequate, then why have you diminished the rights of so many citizens and their data rights based on who they are? Uh, the second issue which could stand in the way um, is enforcement. 
by the Data Protection Authority. I won't get into this. I'm, I'm sure I could fill in uh, an, an entire panel session, but there are issues about the track record of the data protection regulator failing to regulate on the big things, such as the, the, the ad tech that Johnny Raya works on. It's even in little things. For example, um, last year we had the A-levels fiasco where students were uh, graded algorithmically um, rather than by the results they would have had, that they missed school from the pandemic and a lot of young people's lives were, were temporarily uprooted and destroyed and the regulator's response was, oh, what about that? When they should have prevented it from happening in the first place. We need a strong regulator with teeth. We don't need someone who is a friend. It's, it's a regulator's job to speak truth to power, not be the uh, rubber stamping body. Um, another domestic issue we, we worry about interfering with adequacy is any sort of domestic deregulation in the light of Brexit. Um, a good example of that was the nat national data strategy, which was government's uh, plan for. So what do we want to do with data now that we're out of the European Union and its pesky laws? And you could read the national data strategy consultation thinking, OK, this is this is a very useful pro-immigration or pro-innovation um, plan to get a conversation going on how to use data more sensibly and flexibly. Or you could read it as many of us did and think, did Dominic Cummings write this? Because it was all this sort of like, yay, gadgets and tech, and let's just throw the data everywhere and throw inmates a contract and get rid of those pesky data protection laws um, and risk throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Now, if you talk to the team behind the national data strategy, they were actually absolutely horrified by the monster that they ended up creating because they hadn't thought of these issues. But it's our job as a digital rights organization to raise them. And the final issue we keep an eye on that could impact adequacy, again, is a consequence of our post-Brexit domestic legislation. But it's plans for sort of tangential things related to new legislation, such as the online harms framework, which could impact privacy. Um, just this week, we've had the Home Secretary making another attack on end-to-end -end encryption. And there are politicians even hardline, more hardline there than her, who would like to actively criminalize the use of end-to-end -end encryption. Well, that is going to have a massive impact on privacy and data protection and data protection safeguards. The same goes for things like anonymity. We have some who believe we need to eliminate anonymity online and on social media. Um, everyone should have their identity verified because they might be posting abuse. Well, that's gonna have privacy and data protection implications too. Same thing, exactly the same, but for age verification, there's a huge push to age verify. A lot of this, the services and um, sites and apps we use, um, as, uh, ostensibly to protect children. But what that does is it creates um, identifiable databases of everything we do on the line, online linked to a person. Um, and all of these can push data protection and data protection adequacy over the edge. So we're here to make sure that those questions are being looked at and taken seriously and addressed and that we're not just sweeping them under the rug saying, oh, here's those, those digital rights people causing trouble again. Because as Boyana said, data protection is not about law, it's about people. Yeah, thank you so much for outlining so, so clearly and so eloquently all the ways in which these safeguards for data adequacy will impact people in very real ways in terms of data security for their mobile phones, the importance of encryption, how that ties it back again to data adequacy standards and rules at the EU level, which places a very significant emphasis on not just the protection of rights via data protection rules, but also data security, in that data security is very much inherently tied to the protection of not just data subjects, fundamental rights, but also to the security of that entire ecosystem. And I think as well, you highlighted a very important point regarding one of the key ways in which the UK data protection rules diverge from the GDPR. Now, of course, we know that different member states have a certain amount of discretion in terms of derogations, but of course, these were considered always to be subject to a much more narrow interpretation because the GDPR is a regulation and not like a directive, like we had a directive in the UK prior to the Data Protection Act of 2018. So the immigration exemption that you highlight 
was indeed quite a surprise to many data protection lawyers in terms of how it departed from any provisions in the GDPR itself. Of course, how that is going to impact upon the future of the data adequacy agreement is going to be quite significant because it is one of those key derogations that it very much starkly sets the UK legal framework aside from most other EU data protection law framework. So that is a very significant point. Now, if I could bring us to our third panelist, I am just so engrossed in all these fascinating points our panelists are using. We have to make sure that we have all of our presentations and then we can open up the floor to a very rich conversation that involves all of our participants as well. I'd like to introduce everyone to our third panelist today, Neil Brown. Neil is a solicitor and managing director of English law firm Decoded Legal. He is good at advising internet, telecoms and technology businesses, but bad at writing buyers. If you don't mind me adding in, Neil, but wears strikingly fabulous shirts relevant to legal topics at conferences, if maybe you want to consider that for future. Neil, whenever you're ready, we would very much like to hear your views on this important topic. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you were talking earlier, Nora, about how the picture behind you of the pub in Galway that sells that excellent pint of Guinness and yes, international transfers leading people to drinking. I can understand how you get to that. Um, Karen spoke this morning about the impact of Brexit on data protection. And for me, practically, one of the main challenges to controllers and processors in the UK from Brexit was uncertainty. Clearly, they weren't the only people affected by uncertainty of Brexit. But there was definitely uncertainty as to what the rules would look like. Will there be a, Would there be an adequacy decision or not? And what this really led to was controllers and processors wasting their money planning and putting measures in place to deal with the possibility of things that may never have happened, um, to deal with the possibility that the UK was going to become a third country without a finding of adequacy. Um, so far, that hasn't happened, but could it happen? Yes, absolutely. We might not get a finding of adequacy. Even if we do, it might not last. Um, but to me, Rather than Brexit, it was the decision in Schrems 2 that has had the greater impact in practical terms. And before Schrems 2, compliance with the Chapter 5 transfer regime was pretty easy. You worked out your data flows and you identified the locations to which data would be transferred. Based on that, you typically either relied on a finding of adequacy, an adequacy decision, or you put in place the appropriate set of the standard contractual clauses. Things got a bit more complicated uh, when it looked like the CJE was going to kill off the, as it was then, safe harbour. Sensible organisations would attempt to try and bridge the, the gap contractually by automatically incorporating the model clauses uh, if or when safe harbour failed. And people who did that were then in a pretty good position when exactly the same thing happened with Privacy Shield. One mechanism fell away, another mechanism automatically came into place. But now, it's a lot more complicated and it loads a lot more risk onto the transferring organization. And I have a huge amount of sympathy for smaller organizations trying to work out how on earth they can use very common and popular cloud-based tools in particular, but do so in a manner that's consistent with the expectations of data protection law. Um, the organization still needs to map its data flows. The focus is still on the place to which the data are transferred rather than the uh, as Michael talked about earlier, the sort of the connectivity, the pipes that carry the data to that place and wherever they may go and whatever surveillance may be possible on those pipes. Um, probably more to come on that, but they still need to do their data mapping. They then need to understand the laws in the countries to which they're transferring the data. And there's no official centralized repository of that information. And that step in itself is going to be out of reach for all number of controllers um, who can't afford specialist, local, or potentially global legal advice on this. They're left trying to get answers from the recipient organization who A, has a vested interest in selling their service, and B, the transferor has no way of validating the answers anyway. They're left in a very tricky position. 
And even if they can work out what the law is, they need to do a sort of GDPR gap analysis. What does the GDPR require? What do the local legal framework, uh, what does that entail? Um, and what will we need to do to bridge that? That's something a lot of organizations aren't going to be in a position to do. And when they've done their gap analysis, they need to work out what controls are needed, be those technical controls, uh, organizational controls, or whatever they are, to bridge those gaps, to ensure a level of protection that's essentially equivalent to the GDPR. And we've got some helpful guidance or draft guidance from regulators about this, but it's a very lengthy document that's designed for practitioners, not really for individual organizations to try and work through. So even if they get through all of that and they manage to start a transfer in a compliant manner, they then need to continuously monitor, not just what the data, what's happening with the data, but the laws, the political environment, the activities of uh, public bodies in all of the countries to which they transfer data and be prepared at the tip of a hat to turn off that transfer in the event they're transferring to somewhere that could no longer be essentially equivalent. So even if the court got it right, even if the CJE made the right decision based on the law, the impact is a situation that's close to unviable, close to unworkable for a huge number of organisations. And we talk about a risk-based approach. In how many cases is it little more than a gamble, a hope that you're not the one that gets picked on by the regulator because you simply can't do what it appears that the court expects? And if we want a splinter net, if we want a not really a world wide web anymore, if we want a great firewall of the EU, we're certainly going the right way about it. Thank you so much, Neil, for very impressively critiquing what is a hugely complex legal judgment, nay, two complex legal judgments, both Schrems 1 and Schrems 2, and talking about their practical impact for businesses and the compliance requirements that they are now expected to meet. It does seem that the Court of Justice of the EU is likely to continue to play a very significant role in the establishing and also the application and interpretation of these standards. And that, as you really eloquently highlighted, may be providing clarity to practitioners in the area and to regulators and to policymakers but there is a significant gap between that level of knowledge and capacity and resources and the resources available then to SMEs who simply have more than just one piece of EU legislation that they will have to consider whether their business practices are compliant with or not in terms of data transfers. And there is here a very alarming reality that if we don't perhaps consider the alternatives to data adequacy, that we are again very much leaving at sea so many of these small businesses that will then need very clear and very comprehensive guidance as to when they, they as to where, excuse me, they then turn if we have a equivalent SREM situation for the UK in the next few years. Fortunately, the GDPR does provide that there is such a body, there is an oversight body, a series of oversight bodies, one at the EU level, the European Data Protection Board, and also at the national level, we have data protection authorities who are tasked with providing this guidance, this interpretation of these very complex legal rules to translate them to a national level, how they apply within national legal systems of the member states, and then how they also apply in a commercial context. This is no easy feat, but I'm absolutely delighted to say that we have a representative from one of these very important oversight bodies with us today, Nicola Coogan. Nicola is an assistant commissioner in the Office of the Data Protection Commission of Ireland, heading up, heading up the International Transfers Unit. 
This area of responsibility includes approval of binding corporate rules applications for multinational organizations, provision of advice and guidance to companies and public sector bodies on data transfers. Nicola also represents the Data Protection Commission at meetings of the International Data Transfer Subgroup and other meetings of the European Data Protection Board where all European Economic Area Data Protection Authorities work collectively on guidance and data transfers issues generally. At the European Data Protection Board level, Nicola has worked on Brexit guidance on transfers and on the frequently asked questions following the judgment of the Court of Justice on the Schrems case. She is also a member of the European Data Protection Board Task Force, working on the recommendations on supplementary measures arising out of that judgment. Nicola, we are absolutely delighted to welcome you here today and to join us in this discussion. Whenever you're ready, we would very much like to hear your thoughts. Uh, thank you, Nora. Um, yeah, I was uh, I was going to just go straight into my in defence of adequacy uh, piece because that that's kind of uh, the most recent um, aspect. But probably just by way of an update because I do work on the supplementary measures and following on from Neil's um, piece. Um, there is a lot of work going on with a revised paper recommendations paper on the supplementary measures, which I hope will go further to help those smaller and medium enterprises to, to understand what they need to do and maybe give a much better steer on how to go about doing it, you know, in conjunction with their data importers. But it I hopefully will set the scene for, for, for them to at least know where to start without maybe having to go straight into buying in this hugely expensive global legal expertise. Um, I mean, I can't guarantee it, but I think it will go a little bit further because following the public consultation, we had over 200 submissions you know, so obviously there's a huge view uh, out there with phase one or with draft one of recommendations of, of what was missing. So I, we've taken a lot of the submissions on board and the, the uh, it's probably the, the document you will see a more most significant change, I think, because normally after public consultation, the, the changes aren't huge. But I think this one hopefully will go some way towards addressing some of the voiced concerns. Um. But to go back to the adequacy um, decision, because, you know, it would have had involvement with the EDPB opinion um, on the adequacy decision and adequacy, whatever view you have at the moment, is it's viewed as the gold standard for transfers. If, if you want to transfer, it's if, if, the, if the country has an adequacy decision, it just makes your life so much easier for as a company um, because you don't have to think of the other chapter five tools. You could you just need to put in the normal data protection contracts but um you can the data flows are, are, can remain uninterrupted um but like heather mentioned adequacy is tied with the human rights charter and that human rights framework as well so it's not just a matter of of looking at the data protection regime the wider legislation and legislative framework in the country has to be looked at um and so the commission's job is, is not to be undersold. It's quite difficult, particularly in countries where the familiarity is not there initially. So the view would be the UK was simple because they were being the member state up to very recently and, and the regime is in line with the GDPR. And that's that's that was that was a good starting point because it, it makes life easier when you know what you're dealing with as regards the data protection authority, the data protection laws. But it also makes life difficult because you know them so well and you assume you make assumptions and it's 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 kind of to go back to the brass tacks of, of the adequacy to look at all the items that are in the adequacy referential. That's how we would would have looked at the decision um, to see has the assessment been done. So it's the opinion that came out was quite there were some views, you know, the, that it might have been negative or 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 wary, um, but I think it focused on on areas of divergence because it acknowledged at the outset that there are huge areas of convergence that that we really didn't need to worry about, and they were given because of our familiarity with the UK and the fact that the the UK GDPR is more or less, with some exceptions, a mirror image of the GDPR. The Data Protection Act um, would have already been in place and the ICO was already established. So some countries have to start from scratch with all of those elements. So it's not the case for the UK. 
So the areas of convergence, yes, the, the core concepts within the data protection laws are just are very similar, and then the the, the the GDPR and the regime. But the the areas of concern um, needed to be highlighted because this is an unusual adequacy decision in that the commission put in a sunset clause, which they haven't done before. So in four years, they have to fully reassess the provisions again. I think this comes from the UK government um, stated intention to develop independent policies and data protection thoughts. And I know one of the speakers this morning mentioned that as, and I, and I do agree that it's, I don't think it, it was meant in the way that it's, some people t took it, that it's like we're going to go our own way completely because like um, some of the speakers this morning, I think that would be um, in the way the world is is framed and tra and uh, transfers and business, it, it, would, it wouldn't be a good idea. But so I don't think that um, there was a, a small bit of focus on that um, in the opinion, but I don't think it's it's the biggest area of concern. Like Heather mentioned as well, the immigration exemption, because it's so broad and there is proceedings ongoing, it's just something we highlighted in the EGBB as something that the Commission should continue to monitor uh, because we have concerns over that. Um, another area that the EGBB would have uh, would worry about is onward transfers, so that fine, the data transfers to the UK, there is that level of essential equivalence, but there are certain international agreements and um, that the UK might have with other countries. There might be other countries the UK deem as adequate that are not deemed adequate by the, uh, the European Commission. And that might be a way of data leaving the EU in a, in a less safe manner and the safeguards not travelling with the data, which is required by the GDPR. So all of these, the EDPB have called out all these areas and asked the Commission to continue monitoring. And also within built into this draft uh, decision is this level of monitoring that either side can highlight areas of concern. Also, the Commission have called on us as, as DPAs and regulators if we come across areas where we feel there's starting to be a divergence in the UK or investigating a case and there's something amiss that we highlighted to the Commission because it's built into the decision that they have a monitoring and ongoing role, they can suspend part or all of the um, decision or they can withdraw it completely and they don't have to wait until the sunset clause of four years um, comes. Another area that we highlighted in the DPB was the absence of Article 48. Um, now the Commission would have given us legislation that they felt would have addressed that um, but it's just something again that that um, there's protections that article is there for a reason to protect is provided by it. And if it's not replicated in the UK GDPR, why not? And it's just something, again, we've asked the Commission to, to, um, to, to keep an eye on. So really, the EDPB, we as an EDPB, we took a cautious kind of welcoming of the adequacy decision with also highlighting the areas of concern. And there would have been a lot more discussion at, at the level of the subgroups that, that were involved with drafting the opinion, um, you know, about other worrying about potential divergence that may be going into significant details about what if this happens, what if that happens, but that wasn't deemed as, it's not helpful. It's it's really, the role is for the commission to, to, to monitor this decision, but with, with all of us, um, Taking taking a role and not ignoring um, concerns and not raising them with the commission. So really, what we came down to was the most important um, elements that um, the EDPB feels need to be watched. So the opinion, the opinion, um, I would say was cautiously welcoming. I think that's probably the the de how I would define it at the end of the day. So. That's really all I'm happy to discuss further in questions if anyone has anything on it. Thank you so much, Nicola. I think you've given a very, very impressive overview of what is a very intricate and complex assessment by the European Data Protection Board. And I think you're absolutely right to highlight the two essential points that Yes, there is divergence, as was highlighted by the academic panel this morning, but also it's very important to note that there are a number of areas of, of convergence, 
but that also inherent within the European Data Protection Board's assessment and, and prior to that, the European Data Protection Supervisor's opinion on the trade agreement, for instance, of which there is, there, there is some overlap, there is an inherent area of, of, of uncertainty in terms of the relevant judgments from the, the court, from the Court of Justice of the EU. It is very much going to depend hugely also on the new rules that emanate from those judgments. So this is a highly complex and highly evolving area. And I think the, the provision you mentioned regarding the sunset clause is very significant because while of course we have from the Schrems judgments a clear requirement that there be periodic review and we also had that provision too in the GDPR that data adequacy decisions are subject to the periodic review of the European Commission that definitely places a very explicit and firm commitment as to the ongoing dialogue between the European Data Protection Board and the EU institutions as a whole with the UK government going forward in terms of how this review is going to develop in future. And on that note, I am delighted to introduce everyone to Oliver Patel. Oliver is head of Inbound Data Flows at the UK government's Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, DCMS. He is leading work on securing data adequacy, ad, ad, uh, excuse me, data adequacy decisions from the EU, pardon me. He also leads the Inbound Data Flows function, which aims to remove unnecessary barriers to data flows into the UK from countries worldwide. Oliver previously worked as head of public policy at University College London's European Institute, where he undertook academic research and policy engagement on Brexit, digital policy and cross-border data flows. Prior to this, Oliver worked at Nesta, the Innovation Foundation, and in the House of Commons. Oliver, you're very welcome. We are delighted you're able to join us here today, and we'd very much welcome your views on this very topical area. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, <clears throat> it's great to be here today and to see some familiar faces. So thanks for, thanks for having me. I wasn't able to make the first session, unfortunately, so apologies if for, for missing that. But um, lo lots of really um, important and interesting points have already been made. And I, I'm going to sort of say what I originally planned to say, but happy to come back to any of the points or if there are any questions raised based on the points that have been made by, by the speakers so far. Happy to come back to any of that. But the, the two um, contributions that I wanted to make um, was to first give an update on, on where we are with the EU's um, assessment of the, the EU's adequacy decisions for the UK. And then to talk a bit more about the UK's future policy on international data transfers. Um, so as we all know, the Commission undertook a thorough assessment of the UK, which lasted for about a year. UK officials were heavily involved in that and provided significant amounts of information to the Commission. We believe that the draft decisions published by the Commission in February were the right, the right outcome. Uh, they rightly recognised the UK as adequate and, and as meeting the EU's adequacy test. And we thought that, you know, given the UK's high data protection standards and our close alignment with the EU's framework, this was the only reasonable outcome. And we see no reason why these decisions should not be adopted by the end of June, which is the, the deadline of the, of the bridging mechanism agreed in the um, trade and cooperation agreement. Um, of course, this requires a vote from uh, EU member states in the Council but we are urging the EU to complete this process, uh, this approval process swiftly um, to give certainty and confidence to business. We think you know, the, the work of doing the adequacy assessment has done and now it's just about getting it over the line. And we think that this will happen uh, relatively swiftly and that's what we're urging. Uh, quite a lot of comments have been made today about um, how the EU has done data transfers, the situation post rams 2, um, the complexity of the current situation, especially for, for businesses and small businesses. Um, and that is quite an, brings me on quite nicely to talk about the UK's uh, international data transfers regime. So 
the UK government is unashamedly pro-growth, pro-innovation and pro-business when it comes to data transfer specifically, data policy more broadly. And this pro-growth and pro-innovation approach is reflected on our um, data transfer policy. So although we have uh, repatriated these powers from the EU, um, we've inherited essentially the same legal system for data transfers as, as outlined in the GDPR with some small differences. But in law, it's, it's a very similar system. But we believe that this system can be uh, interpreted and implemented in a different manner. And that's, that's what we plan to do. So just to give an example, there are over 140 countries or an estimate of over 140 countries in the world which have some form of data protection legislation. And we, we just think that um, the EU having only recognized 12 countries as adequate over the long period of time in which the EU has had these powers, we just don't think that that is uh, a sufficient number given the importance of cross-border data transfers for business and for the modern economy. And our government ministers have been quite clear and, and um, transparent about our ambitions to expand this list. So to um, assess and recognize more countries as adequate. It's a big policy uh, objective of, of DCMS and our ministers. And we think that doing so will provide new opportunities for, for business and by facilitating unrestricted data flows from the UK to other uh, key trading partners around the world. When, in, in doing this, we're going to take a more creative, flexible and pragmatic approach. What does that mean exactly? Well, one thing we're not doing is we're not looking for, when, when assessing a country for adequacy, we're not going to be looking for sort of point-to-point -point replication or an exact copy and paste of, of UK law in, uh, in the third country that we're assessing. We're going to be looking at the outcomes that, that a given system delivers in practice, uh, acknowledging that different countries have different legal cultures, different approaches to privacy, different cultures around privacy. Um, and it's, it's the outcomes and what the system delivers in terms of privacy protection is what matters more than what the law says in exact, in exact wording. So just an, another point that the UK has rolled over all of the EU's adequacy decisions. So that means that the 12, the 12 countries which the EU has recognized as adequate, that is also the case in UK law. So data can flow freely, or data can be freely transferred by organizations from the UK to those 12 countries, as well as to the EU member states and the EEA states. And it's our policy position to, um, to work to increase that list. So I think I'll, I'll stop there, but yeah, happy to take any questions on, on the uh, government's policy or on any of the issues that have been uh, discussed by the panelists so far. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Oliver, for joining us today and for highlighting what is a very ambitious agenda for the UK government in terms of how data protection and data transfers also fit in more broadly to the national data strategy and also as I know you weren't able to attend this morning, but what was highlighted there was that this is all part of a much broader policy that feeds into foreign policy and other international objectives that the UK has in terms of both merging the importance of innovation and being world leading in that particular context. And then at the, so, and then at the same time, incorporating legislation in future that also promotes online safety, such as the online harms bill. So this is a very complex, it is a, a very ambitious policy strategy, and it is going to be fascinating to see what developments take place in this area in terms of alignments with the EU data protection rules to which data ad adequacy is going to be key. As you rightly mentioned, we're not talking about a standard that is copying and pasting in terms of data adequacy alignment. But at the same time, there are going to be certain 
EU data protection rules that are likely to be further tested in future by the Court of Justice of the EU. And we may see that in other data transfer contexts. I think what you also mentioned, which is really interesting to the ongoing discussion, is where data transfers as an international regime may develop in future. Uh, this morning it was mentioned that the UK in its role as presidency of the G7 may be exploring more of those policy frameworks in the future. And there has been much discussion by many commentators about what an international legal framework on data transfers would look like and how that would bring greater clarity and be in alignment with the existing frameworks within the EU, but then how, as one of our academic speakers highlighted this morning, Henry Pierce, how that would enable other countries to explore other opportunities and, and possibilities for reform that haven't been explored as yet within the EU legal context. So, so much rich discussion there that you've raised in terms of what we can address later on in the Q&A session. But if I could now bring us to our next panelist who is joining us today, Dr. Johnny Ryan. He is a senior Hello. fellow at the Irish Council for Civil Liberties and a senior fellow at the Open Markets Institute. He is focused on surveillance, data rights, competition, antitrust and privacy. He is former Chief Policy and Industry Relations Officer at Brave, the private web browser. Dr. Ryan led Brave's campaign for GDPR enforcement and liaised with government and industry colleagues globally. His regulatory interventions and expert commentary has appeared in media, including the New York Times, The Economist, Wired Le Monde, and the front page of the Financial Times. Previously, Dr. Ryan worked in ad tech, media, and policy. His previous roles included Chief Innovation Officer at the Irish Times and Senior Researcher at the Institute of International European Affairs. Dr. Ryan is a regular speaker at High Level Industry Fora and has testified at the United States Senate and the European Commission. Johnny, we're delighted that you're able to join us here today and we very much look forward to hearing your perspectives from civil society on these legal developments and how they're also relevant within the commercial law context. Thank you. Nora, thank you. After that introduction, I'm excited to hear what I have to say too. <laughs> thank you. So I've been in civil society for six months, um, but this is the industry panel. So let me put my industry hat back on and I'll tell you, when I was in industry, in ad tech, the bad guys, they're called the bad guys, by the way, in ad tech, advertising technology. And when I was working for a privacy browser, there was one question that I and my colleagues in industry wanted to know the answer to. Is Europe serious about regulating or is it not? That's all that we wanted to know. <laughs> and this adequacy decision shines a light on that question and it also shines a light on the state of Europe. So let's think of the GDPR in a, in a little bit of an unusual context. Europe used to be the place, right? It used to be the place to be. My background is history and the story of the last century is how Europe became less and less the place at the center of every story. And today it has very few jewels left in its crown. One of those jewels it told everybody was the GDPR. We're doing this thing. And Europe convinced itself, maybe the jury's out on that, but the rest of the world, it did convince that the GDPR was going to be a big deal. And if you look at the global GDP of all of the economies that either have a GDPR clone already on the books or one on the way, you get over 50% of the world's GDP. So it's an amazing um, de facto standard. But the adequacy decision shows the answer to that question that my colleagues and I wanted to know the answer to. Europe is not serious about the GDPR and granting adequacy to the UK today shows that. There's a pattern of behavior here. First, we have catastrophically poor enforcement across the union as it is over the last three years. <clears throat> Just two days ago, I was on uh, an event and Andrea Caselli, who's the CEO of the UK Competition and Markets Authority, pointed to the problem of the one-stop shop and the 
terrible under enforcement by my uh, counterparts in the Irish TPC. So we have a problem, and actually it's across all member states, as far as I can see, with enforcing the GDPR internally. Now, the Commission did not launch an infringement procedure against member states, and I think it had very strong grounds and still does have strong grounds to do so under Article 52.4. Then Brexit happens, and the UK now needs an adequacy decision. And when I say needs, let's put this in context. In the UK's, what do they call it? It's um, explanatory framework document in March 2020. The UK said that the export of services based on European data to the EU was worth 85 billion pounds. Now, I checked, that's 13% of UK global trade in, in everything, not just digital. <clears throat> so the UK needs the adequacy decision. Meanwhile, let's take a look at the problems. I'm sure most of them were well rehearsed this morning. I was on child duty and I'm afraid I missed them. Um, but I, I just want to single out one. Um, about a year ago, I produced a report on the state of data protection authorities across the entire union. And it broke in the New York Times and it, it, it introduced some new data into the discussion. One of the things that I obtained under freedom of information was how many people inside the ICO, the UK's enforcer, are tech specialist investigators. So they have almost 700 full-time equivalent staff. Eight people plus one vacancy as of a year ago were their cyber investigation force. That's 1%, right? So, so the ICO, big though it is, hasn't actually done much. I mean, it really hasn't for quite some time. And there's a reason. It only has a handful of people who seem to be configured for the digital age. I know they have an innovation and policy team, but that's, that's quite a, a, a remote thing from enforcement. So clearly the commission should have said, whatever about our own member states who have been a disaster here at implementing the GDPR, you who need our data, you must strengthen and reform your enforcer. And the commission failed to do that. So I'm pretty sure uh, that the commission has shown us, this new commission, that it's tired of the last commission's project, the GDPR, and it's moved on to new legislation like the DSA and the DMA. No infringement procedures and an easy adequacy decision. And they took the explanatory framework, which is full of holes at face value. Now, there's another reason why this matters. Aside from exposing people across the union to problems uh, uh, in the UK, I, I think they might be exposed to that across the union anyway, um, in the protection of their data rights. There's another reason this matters, and I'll finish on this. Last Thursday, Ron Wyden, he's a senator, he happens to be the chair of the Trade Committee, so he's a very important senator. <clears throat> he introduced a bill called the Protecting Americans Data from Foreign Surveillance Draft Bill. It's not a bill, it's a draft. Now, what Wyden's bill says is anyone who wants to process, and they use the term personal data, must have adequate law and adequate enforcement of the law. Now, the reason why the UK shouldn't have, have got adequacy <coughs> is that under um, uh, GDPR 45.2, the Commission should have considered not just the existence of an enforcer, but of the effective functioning of the enforcer, which is the problem with the ICO. It's one thing to have transcribed the European acquis and to have, you know, an, an in-name enforcer who does things. It's another thing to have an effectively uh, functioning one. The same standard or something very similar is in Wyden's bill. If a country is put on a list of countries that may have a perfectly fine law, but don't have any enforcement of it, which would be most of Europe, then under that draft bill, they can be added to a list of countries that, that cannot receive personal data from the US unless each company involved applies to the Department of Commerce for a license. And that is the same application process that we would need if we were a company to apply for if we wanted nuclear material from the US. <laughs> now, the same thing may be happening, we don't know yet, but it may be happening that is happening competition and antitrust. 
Europe talked a very good game for 10 years, but didn't really do much that, that mattered. And then America came and took the football back and did stuff. And if that happens and the commission does not take its own regulation seriously and persists in this kind of nonsense without even forcing the UK to take it seriously, we are going to find ourselves in trouble. And that trouble comes in two shapes. One, we might have friction with other jurisdictions who start to take it seriously. They actually believe what we sold them. <laughs> that would be ironic. Um, and the second problem <coughs> I have forgotten now. <laughs> anyway, there was a good list of two. I will leave it at that. Thank you very much, Johnny. I think you highlighted very clearly a lot of the concerns that have been raised by civil society following the publication of the European Data Protection Board's opinion. And as, of course, you know, and as the rest of the panel knows quite well, this is very much not the end of the matter. We still have to have this adequacy decision approved by other EU institutions and as Karen McCullough highlighted and other panelists in the academic session this morning, there is still also the possibility of the decisions both for the GDPR and the law enforcement directive being subject to legal challenge. So this is very much still an ongoing conversation in terms of policy making and I think it's another reason why this event today is just so very timely. And I mean, you also raise another very a number of other very significant points, which was also highlighted this morning in terms of the fact that we simply can't just frame these conversations in terms of EU policy making. There are now very similar policy making conversations and frameworks being proposed at the federal level within the US. And there are some very significant reforms being put forward among the ones that you now just mentioned, Johnny, in terms of compliance and the, the two threshold requirement that it's not just about the legal frameworks that countries have adopted, but it's also about their effectiveness and adequacy in practice, which is a very significant point. And also you highlighted too the concerns about the, the capacity and, and resources of data protection authorities in terms of fulfilling what seem to be ever expanding roles and responsibilities, not under just the GDPR and the law enforcement directive, but also under future judgments of the Court of Justice of the EU, they may also be expanded in future in terms of their role as, as guardians of data protection, quote unquote, as the court has stated. So the importance of the oversight mechanisms, mechanisms and practices is, is very significant. Equally, that's probably a factor that also was given considerable weight in the European Data Protection Board's opinion, given how well resourced and how influential the UK's data protection authority has been at the EU level. So it's going to be very interesting going forward how the roles and responsibilities of these oversight bodies are going to develop, particularly, as you mentioned, in terms of upcoming frameworks like the EU regulation on AI and on the also Perhaps in the not so distant future, we shall see who is the optimist among us and who is not. The final adoption of the e-privacy regulation, when that also, <laughs> I can see some shaking heads there. All in good time, everyone, all in good time. But I think this highlights again, what is another important point that Neil touched on, which is where do all of these new compliance rules leave commercial entities, not just the multinationals, but also small to medium businesses. And again, we don't just you know, place an increasing burden on oversight bodies such as the National Data Protection Authorities, but we also then start to think more about alternatives to data adequacy, like certification, like binding corporate rules, like standard contractual clauses. What are their limitations and how much further can other mechanisms like certifications be explored? So on that note, I am delighted to introduce, last but not at all least, our final panelist for today. Eduardo, you have been very patient. 
Eduardo Usturan is Global Co-Head of Hogan Lovell's Privacy and Cybersecurity Practice. Eduardo Usturan is widely recognized as one of the world's leading privacy and data protection lawyers and thought leaders. With over, with over two decades of experience, Eduardo advises multinationals and governments around the world on the adoption of privacy and cybersecurity strategies and policies. Eduardo has been involved in the development of the EU data protection framework and was listed by Politico as the most prepared individual in its GDPR, GDPR power matrix. That is quite the accolade, Eduardo. Based in London, Eduardo leads a highly dedicated team advising on all aspects of data protection law, from strategic issues related to the latest technological developments such as AI and connected devices, to the implementation of global privacy compliance programs and mechanisms to legitimize international data flows. Eduardo, you are very welcome. Thank you so much for your patience. Please, whenever you're ready, we'd love you to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. So, and it, I don't mind being the last one because I can benefit from uh, everyone's uh, knowledge and uh, everyone's interventions, which uh, have been fascinating. So, let me finish this round of presentations by going to to the beginning, and by that I mean to the very beginning. Um, by the very beginning, I mean the early '90s, when in the EU, the European Commission was trying to create this new framework that was going to protect personal data across the European Union. And at the time, the EU had this dilemma of how to ensure that this new framework that was being created was really going to protect the data in the face of what we could call data globalization, the fact that data was starting to really flow on, on the internet. And we take that for granted today, but 25 years ago, that was quite, quite a new thing. So this dilemma was resolved by creating a prohibition, a prohibition that we have all lived with for, for again, over 25 years. And it could have been something different, as, as Bojana said at the beginning, um, they could have come up with a completely different approach. But they, they went for a prohibition on international data transfers to unsafe or inadequate jurisdictions. And of course, one of the solutions to overcome that was to create this concept of adequacy. And that, as, as we can all see, is not new. And if that had been the end of it, then it would have been a very straightforward exercise where the European Commission would have undertaken some kind of legal analysis to assess adequacy. But what happened fairly quickly was that it became obvious that this concept of adequacy and adequacy findings by the European Commission were a very effective political tool. And by political, I cover everything that goes with that, economic and social and everything that goes with that. And frankly, that is the reason why we are all here today in, in this session, because of the political side of, of the adequacy determination as a tool, not because it's a legal instrument. And there are two main reasons why it, it, is, is, a, it is a political tool. One, because it is very effective at controlling what we could call the freedom of movement of data, which has a lot of value. And Oliver was referring very accurately earlier that in all these years, only 12 jurisdictions have been regarded as adequate. And there is a, de a degree of will in, in going for adequacy and the European Commission as an institution making the effort, which is considerable, to declare a, a country or a jurisdiction as adequate. Because of all the economic implications that that has, and it's a lever that the European Union uses to, con to, to, to be where they want to be in terms of ensuring that level of freedom of data. So that's one aspect of it. And the other aspect, which is entirely separate, is that it is also a very effective tool to control what we could regard as unjustified access to data by government. 
This is a tool that is very effectively being used by, by privacy activists. And we, we, we have uh, some here today that are, can, it's, a, it's a very strong argument to be made, particularly with the backing of Europe of the European uh, Court of, of Justice decisions. It's a very um, powerful argument to make that the, the the whole prohibition around international data transfers is also to control this potentially unjustifiable and indiscriminate access to data. And therefore, um, from, from a privacy activism pers perspective, if you want, it's really important that the European Commission looks at this aspect in, in the fact the, the fact that, of course, in today's world, every single government in all 200 countries around the world will have a degree of access to, to data. And for that reason, and because this is so politicized, this is a very complex issue, which re gives the opportunity to debate it in the way we're debating it. If we, if we thought for a moment that we could take the politics out of it and we just look at it as a pure legal assessment, it would be very straightforward because European data protection law and the GDPR doesn't say the European Commission can give adequacy to a country that copies our law. It says that the, the European Commission is empowered to give an adequacy finding to countries that have an, an, an essentially equivalent level of protection. And that is an assess that is an, a legal assessment. The UK, it is pretty obvious that is pretty much identical to the rest of the EU in terms of data protection law. And yes, we can debate the effectiveness of the regulatory authority. And yes, we can debate the, the nuances of, of, of how that law is UK the UK, the GDPR is interpreted, but in essence, it's identical. And I tell you that because the organizations, the hundreds of organizations that I work with approach it in exactly the same way. They don't dis differentiate. And of course, we are all aware of the different interpretation. And yes, the UK, they, the ICO has always been more progressive than the French CANIL or the Spanish um, Data Protection Authority, but it's all part of how you interpret the same body of law. So I think it is really interesting to, to just approach this um, from a legal perspective, but also as we, as we can see from a political perspective. And I think the, the, the decision that I guess at one point needs to be made is when we start, when we stop doing politics and when we, we really focus on the legal assessment. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Eduardo. And thanks so much again for, for highlighting again that these very complex legal roles, and I think both you and Johnny and also Heather highlighted this, that we're not just talking about legal rules, but we're talking about legal rules within a very particular context. And we just can't consider the development of these rules in a political vacuum. Of course, we have to think about all of the other economic and technological developments that go alongside that. And that is a very significant point to raise. I think also what's maybe of interest to a lot of individuals in terms of the future of the data adequacy agreements, because of course we're primarily interested today in the data adequacy decision for the GDPR, but of course there is also the data adequacy decision for the law enforcement directive, is what then will happen now and then is it going to be the case? And I think since there are no other questions here, I will take advantage of my position as chair to put it to the panelists as to where, where will we be in four years time? What do the panelists think we'll be dealing with in terms of a review of data adequacy? And I think this is a, a highly 
complex and challenging question. It's never easy to go crystal ball gazing in terms of what the periodic review is going to look like in four years time. But we can also be constructive and positive about this. For instance, where do we see data transfer rules within the UK in four years time? And what relationship do we see with regard to the national regime and approach compared to where the EU rules may be in four years time? Who's, who is brave enough to sit Johnny? Johnny? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hear your views on this. I I I've got a pessimistic answer, which Eduardo has put a, a spike on top of that. I'll throw back at him. Um, Ed, Eduardo, uh, I'm going to put words in your mouth and summarize what you I think said. You said adequacy is about equivalence. It's not. <laughs> it defines it pretty tightly. What adequacy is? It's about adequacy. You either accept the principles or you don't. Just because Europe's crap at enforcing the principles doesn't mean that if you're equally crap, you get away with having European data. Now, the problem is we've had, as far as I can see, maybe I'm being unfair, but I don't think I am. In this area of law, we've had a decade and a half of box ticking because it didn't matter. <laughs> there were no sanctions, so it didn't matter. Now there are sanctions, but they're not being used. Not many people are going to court. And unless something changes, we're going to continue with this box ticking stuff. And we're going to go through a kind of a theatrical compliance. And if the commission keeps going the way it's going, it's going to undermine this whole project. So I have a very pessimistic view. And I'm beginning to think it's essential to start litigating against the commission for how it has handled this. Anyway, so that's how I'll start off. I'll start off with contention. What a surprise, Johnny. But thank you. Thank you for your very provocative comments. So just to follow up on your metaphor, we had another great metaphor this morning to treat data not as oil, but to consider it the new soil, which yeah. I actually think works very well in terms of how data is now so integrated yeah. in any number of legal frameworks. So is it fair for me to interpret your response, Johnny, as your view of data adequacy at the moment is that this is a, a box ticking exercise, that it is theatrical compliance or compliance theatre, I'm quoting you correctly. Well, and do you think that the data adequacy regime as we currently understand it, is still going to be in force or will it look significantly different in four years' time? Uh, uh, with this current commission, I think it's a box ticking exercise. And that might change. Uh, but yeah, presently it is. I know it hasn't been in the past necessarily. Thank you very much, Jenny. I'll just stop you there because we have a question from one of our panelists from this morning. Karen, we have just a few minutes left on the clock, but please go ahead. Thank you. I, I just I wanted to um, maybe question Johnny's assessment of it. I wondered if we could perhaps frame it as a carrot and stick approach or a pincer movement. So the commission naturally focuses on trade considerations, but then if civil society get involved, we can then have the Court of Justice coming in. And between the two, we incrementally force changes and increase the level of compliance because we've seen that happening with the US gradually, slowly. For the third time, they're seeking an adequacy assessment. It's taking too long, but arguably they are raising their standards over time. And maybe it's through this carrot and stick mechanism, the adequacy decision being offered as a carrot by the commission and the court coming along as a stick afterwards. Thank you very much, Karen. Would anybody else like to respond to Karen's point, given that we just have a few moments left? All very pensive and... Mm. So, so maybe it's not to Karen's point, but it's something that actually kind of Johnny said, but, but, but also where this discussion was going. I wonder whether there is, I mean, we have to be, because look, there is, uh, there are lots of, um, problems with with the regime and we have to work at, at this better but it is this isn't about ticking the box really it is about 
what's the purpose of the law? And, and Johnny, maybe here I, I slightly disagree. And Heather, the purpose of the law for me is not enforcement. The purpose of a law is delivering good level of privacy protection for people, right? And of course, taking corrective action when that doesn't work. So to me, the purpose of a regulator is to ensure that we have got accountability, responsible data use, and it can be robust. We can actually use data for benefits of everybody, but also making sure it is protected from privacy perspective. perspective. So I would like, I love the metaphor. I actually don't use oil at all. I think that's terrible. I actually use environmental protection because it's about, data is about, it's about environment. We need all to benefit from this data, but in a way that is fair, in a way that is measured, in a way that is responsible, respects other rights, but also globally, we all have a piece of this cake. So so I think that's, that we have to change the narrative somewhat. And, and to me, carrots and sticks is also the way we incentivize companies to behave. You know, how are companies going to really behave well because of, of a fine? No, they're going to incorporate that into their business bottom line. They're going to behave well because it matters to them how they can use data, because they, it matters to them where data goes, because it matters to them to have more people, more, more consumers uh, with them than somebody else. And, and that's where the regulator should be pushing. That's where we should be pushing and pushing the accountability and this digital responsibility and making sure companies see this as a kind of self enlightened self-interest, really. I think there is a lot of that. Final point, why don't we also explore instead of adequacy, why don't we explore, and Oliver Patel may be doing this, right, Oliver? Um, Council of Europe, you know, why don't we, I mean, aren't the countries of Council of Europe supposed to be adequate anyway? Mexico has, has um, ratified this. There's some other ones, non-EU. I mean, why do we have to take a year to go through tick the box exercise of adequacy? I, you know, so I actually do hope UK is more agile. I hope we are all a little bit more, what's the word, innovative in the way we think about what are the like-minded group of countries countries that actually have got similar views on data, not the same, but similar. And I would put U.S. in that bucket as well. And to, 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 to Johnny's point, U.S. FTC is an awesome enforcer. U.S. FTC, through their consent decrees, doesn't fine a company. It actually compels the company to implement privacy program, to have privacy oversight board, to do measures, technical, organizational. That's what kind of matters to me, because to me, the purpose of what this law is about is to del- to race to the top the level of privacy protection, not to race to the top how we write laws, which, by the way, we are all going to see now with GDPR, laws are going to hurt us because the words do matter. They matter at the CJU. They matter also in local courts. And we are going to start seeing how courts start interpreting GDPR very, very literally. And then we're going to say, goodness me, what have we done, right? And I think that's the moment. It's an aha moment that I'm certainly having. And, and, and so, so maybe shifting the discussion to kind of more constructive Council of Europe style, you know, countries that, that have got that sort of same view, seeing them as adequate. Anyway, lots of things on the, on the, on the table. Thank you very much, Brawana. I'm very quickly, just we've just got a minute to go, so I'm just very quickly going to make reference to the questions that were put to the panel. And um, if it's possible, for you to just take them into advisement. Uh, James from the floor has made the point that a box ticking exercise does not protect data subject rights and that what's needed is an international transfer mechanism that protects rights, but also allows business economic freedom. James, I think we're all very much in agreement with that important point. It's just the getting there that we're all striving, I believe, to, to get to. And Carolyn Lamptey, a question for Johnny. I'm afraid, Johnny, we don't really have time to get this addressed, but I would like to highlight it, that she notes that his starting position, the GDPR is adequate, but that the issue is that, but the issue is that of enforcement. So Johnny, if you're happy, thank you so much to type a direct answer to that. That would be very helpful. Thank you. To end on a a somewhat constructive note, in terms of the UK's position going forward, there are certainly plenty of lessons here to be learned in terms of how to develop future data transfer mechanisms and legal frameworks and how they will align with the EU's data transfer mechanisms and frameworks. There does seem to be very clear consensus from all of the speakers and from both panels today that there is a question mark on the legal certainty of the data adequacy decisions that have been granted to the UK. 
And hopefully we will all be able to join together again, perhaps to discuss where we'll all be in four years time. But for now, I would like to thank all of our speakers, this fantastic panel for such a rich and fruitful and, you know, really wonderfully diverse debate and discussion looking at the data transfer and adequacy debate from all different perspectives, the perspectives of civil society, regulators, policy makers, the concerns of industry, the tensions between risk assessment models and then fundamental rights protection and then the realities of co-regulation how much of a burden can we actually place on businesses to self-regulate and where do we draw the line in terms of how rigid and prescriptive those rules should be both from courts and also from policymakers. so that's all for me this was early delightful in terms of me being able to chair this panel. Thank you all so much for your time. Idina, would you like to add any closing remarks? Uh, yes, just, just like you, Nora, I would like to thank everyone again for their contributions, lovely contributions in the morning, academic perspectives, and now really diverse, as you said, uh, stakeholder, as we call it, in versus commerce perspective. So I do hope we can continue these discussions. And we, we have three additional events in this, in this project, and you might be interested in attending or speaking at one of them. So please do get in touch. The, the next one is on 23rd of June, and it's on data protection concerns in cr cross-border research and practice. So again, thanks to the audience, and thanks, Nora, for co-hosting and chairing, uh, chairing this second panel. And of course, thanks to Delhi for her, for her immense work in the background and organizing all of this. Thank you. Thank you.